Are you looking for an affordable COVID-19 DNA testing or infectious disease clinical testing? Welcome to P23 Labs, a high complexity molecular diagnostics lab that uses the latest technology to offer a full suite of molecular diagnostic tests, clinical tests, and wellness consultations. We give you access to knowledge and healthcare resources that will transform your health. Schedule an appointment and order your custom test today with our healthcare team, www.p23labs.com. All right. All right, we in here. All right, what's going on, guys? Let me get it together here. How y'all doing? I'm a little bit late because I'm in a whole different hemisphere, but I'm here. Let me see where we are in the room. Let me get everybody popping in here. What's going on, guys? Hold on. It's very early in the morning out here, by the way. Y'all bear with me. How y'all doing, man, for those who are tuning in? Y'all come on in the room. Hit the like button. Hit that thumbs up button. All right. What's going on? Let me, um, let me get it together here. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Let me let everybody know on social media that I'm live right now. Um, I think it's eight o'clock back in the States in LA. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, excuse me. And I just ate breakfast out here, hold on. All right, man, how are y'all living? Hope you guys had a very productive week. Let me do one more social media post on my Facebook and then we'll be good to go, guys. One more post on Facebook and then we're good to go. All right, all right. All right, now we're good to go, guys. So now you got my attention. We're here. Everybody come on in the room. Let everybody pile on in here. What's going on with y'all, man? Somebody said I look like I'm in a bathhouse. I look like a 90s album cover, I know. <laughs> man, so what's going on with y'all, man? Glad to have y'all in here. I am out and about, globe trotting. Um, by the way, I'm in, um, I'm in the Maldives right now. Let me give y'all a look, see if y'all can see that out here. Let me lift my camera up a little bit so y'all can see what I'm seeing out here. I'm in the Maldives, very beautiful view out there. The kids out there jumping in front of the, they're jumping in and out of the swimming pool, but I'm in the Maldives. The Maldives, those are a chain of islands, for those who don't know, that's, um, I want to say, is it the Indian Ocean? Let me look at a map real quick. We're right below India, so we're right, we're in the cut. Hold on. Let me see exactly what ocean we're in. I think the, I think we're in the Indian Ocean. And yeah, we're right, uh, we're right below Sri Lanka and India. So I think the Arabian Sea, okay, we're right by the Arabian Sea the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean. Yeah, basically the Indian Ocean. So, so basically we're right in that mix. So we're in the cut. We are on the other side of the planet right now. Do we have jet lag? A little bit, a little bit. No, no, these are not man-made islands. Hit that thumbs up button, y'all. Hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up button. No, these are not man-made islands. These islands are very, very real. These islands are very, very real. Beautiful islands. Beautiful islands out here. It's like an Indiana Jones trek to get here. We gotta take a big plane, and then when we get here, then we gotta take a seaplane, and then the seaplane takes us to another location. Then we gotta take a speedboat, and we're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's almost like we're on a stranded island, but we're at a cool resort here. The resort is cool, the only thing is, um, you know, when to move around the island, you got to depend on the resort staff to come pick you up in the little carts. And, you know, sometimes they can be late. I didn't like that because last night we were eating dinner and the kids were just going to sleep in the chairs. And we had to wait for like 30, 45 minutes for them to come scoop us up. 
and you know, I wish that they had a more efficient way for us to travel around this joint. And um, yeah, it's not too far from North Sentinel Island, that's true. It's not too far from North Sentinel Island. Yeah, this is fantasy. It's beautiful though, I mean the resort is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, because they got you in the middle of nowhere, let me tell you something, if you ever wanna visit here, bring some snacks for your kids, if you got your kids with you. And if you bring your boo out here, bring some snacks for your boo. Because they don't have no stores or anything that has food that you can buy, like little snacks and stuff, they don't have that. Remember, the, the Maldives is a, just a bunch of little islands and there's different resorts on different islands. And because they got you out here stuck, they overcharge for stuff that they do sell. Dude, we, um, there's a little store that sells like beach stuff and sunblock and all that. Family, I'm telling y'all stuff like this, stuff like this that you can get at the 99 cent store. Nigga, they charged us $80 for stuff like this. When I went and got some stuff, I got some toys and I got some sunblock for the kids. And here was the first clue I knew something was going on. They were like, okay, yeah, we're going to charge this to your room. All right? When you hear them say that, we're going to charge it to your room, usually that means they're jacking up the price. They're going to get it to you. They're going to stick it to you on the back end. They're going to stick it to you on the back end. I'm like, we're going to charge it to the room. I was like, oh, let me look at the price. Let me look at how much this is. Man, it was a bottle of sunscreen for $80. I'm like, whoa. You know those little plastic buckets of toys from the 99 cent store? Literally, you get them at the 99 cent store. It was like $35. We got some baby wipes. Not even a real packet of baby wipes. The same baby wipes that you get at the 99 cent store, just a little bitty packet of the little halfway wipes. Those were $27. I'm like, whoa. I said, look, I told my lady, we ain't buying, don't buy nothing at this shit. If we got a mosquito bite, you chop off an aloe vera plant and rub that shit on your skin. Damn it. Let's get some string in a fishing pole and we'll catch our own damn food in this bitch. American dollars. No, no, no. These are American dollars, bro. American dollars. They tax you out here, man. Dude. And what you gonna do? That's the thing. They look at it like, hell, nigga. What, you gonna go to Walmart? <laughs> what you gonna do? You out here on this island, nigga. We're the only deal in town. See, that's what happens when somebody has a monopoly on some shit. Well, where are you going to go? You got to get it. <laughs> Nigga, it was $269 for the shit we got. It would have been $5 at the 99 cent store back home, literally. The stuff we got would have been $5 at home. It was $269 out here. Yeah? They get you as far as that. And they look at you like, well... All right, nigga, the next Walmart is a thousand miles away. How you gonna get back? Ain't no, you can't go nowhere. It's high because they got you stranded. That's why it's high. That's the only reason. The only reason the shit is high is because you can't, literally can't go nowhere else. That I kind of had, a, I had a, I felt a certain way about. I'm like, damn, y'all gonna do, don't do the tourists like that. You yeah. know? $270 for a bucket of toys and sunscreen. Man, I wish I can show y'all the receipt if y'all think I'm bullshitting, man. Oh, dude, it's like, oh, it's a lick. <clears throat> they get you. And another thing they don't tell you, there's giant bats on this damn island. They don't tell you that in the brochure. Nigga, there are giant bats flying around this bitch in broad daylight. Usually you think bats come out at night. Nigga, it's broad daylight, big ass bats looking like pterodactyls, man. It's like Skull Island around this bitch, dude. 
I mean, you got, I ain't never seen bats this huge and they're everywhere. Yeah? Yeah, man, I posted some stuff on my Instagram. And then a bat shitted on me. I'm sitting here chilling, and then some, a plop of brown stuff, plop. Ah, 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 plop. I said, okay, now I'm getting taxed. I'm getting shitted on by the hotel staff with these high prices, and now I'm getting shitted on by big ass bats. God damn. <laughs> yeah, there's a, I think there are fruit bats, because I saw one bat flying around eating a fucking apple with one hand. Ah! Ah! I'm like, God damn. <laughs> okay. These big ass bats, man. So yeah, we out here, and yeah, we ain't trying to walk around at night with these big ass bats floating around here, so, you know. <laughs> so dude, we, I, I'm out here in the, in the exotic wilderness right now. It's beautiful in the daytime, but it gets, it's, it's Skull Island, King Kong Skull Island at night, dude. Man. <laughs> But the people are hella nice. The people here are very, very nice. Very, very nice people here. Very nice people. Yeah. But just, I'm just saying, if you come out here, bring some snacks with you. Bring everything you need. Don't bring everything you need out here. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the bat shitted on me. I'm like, did this motherfucker just shit some Corona on me? I don't want to come back with a new strain of the Rona because I didn't got shitted on. I got some bat shit on me. So I don't know. I got to get tested to see if my, it, it shitted on my leg. So I, I, I want to make sure my leg don't have the hepatitis corona. I don't want to bring a new variant back. Yeah, so it, it didn't get in on a, any open wounds or nothing. So, But uh, look, anyway, but somebody's asking about the crowdfunding for the, uh, the museum. Again, shout out to everybody who contributed, who's still contributing to the building of the Hidden History Museum, ladies and gentlemen. We're doing pretty good right now. We really want to get this thing over the hump. Right now, as far as the Hidden History Museum, ladies and gentlemen, we are at, let me refresh this just to make sure we're right. Refreshing, okay, so we're at two, 174,000, almost 275,000. We got 17 days left, ladies and gentlemen. Now, first of all, I gotta thank all the black folks, the good black family, who contributed this much to the campaign. First, I'm very, very proud of our brothers and sisters. This, remember, this is something that's been done on a grassroots level. These are everyday working class black folks and we got together, the family got together and raised this much in, what, a couple of weeks? We got this in a couple of weeks, ladies and gentlemen. We did this, this is a quarter, over a quarter million dollars. Grassroots only, grassroots black people only. See, we're doing good so far. We got 17 more days. Good black family, I think we can take this thing over the hump, because we got to. Listen to me, we gotta take a look. This campaign, it's all or nothing. Either we get that million or everybody gets their money back. So we got 726 more to go. Black family, do y'all think we can do it? I have confidence in the black family. I, I know we can do it. I know that we can get over that hump. I know we can. And that's the reason why I wanted to put together a project like this so that we can get in the habit of putting together our projects and funding them on a grassroots level without having to go to the dominant society and all that stuff. We can do it on our own. See, all of this is all about getting a certain mindset. This is all about getting a certain mindset of us getting stuff done. And we can do it. And I believe we're going to do it. In those 17 days, we got... 17 days to get $726,000. I know we can do that. Yes, we can. 
black people, we're too powerful to not be able to do that. It's too easy to do. All we have to do is just get on the same page. Now look, we have to understand, this is a power move. That's what today's topic is about. Today is talking about empowerment, the empowerment versus the embarrassment. See, we are team empowerment. We, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm talking about you and I, if you're listening to me right now, and I'm talking about listening in good faith, not just some hater outside of listening just to hate, but I'm talking about if you're really listening to what we're talking about and engaging in our conversations, you are team empowerment. You already have the mentality where you want to be empowered. We have to understand, everybody is not like you. See, we think, and you think, logically, if we do things that's going to empower us, well, we can not be so dependent and vulnerable on not only the dominant white society, all of their, their subgroups that have the same anti-black vitriol. We won't be subjected to them if we start empowering ourselves. You are listening in because you're tired of complaining and posting videos about us getting our ass toe up, and you're thinking, okay, let's all get together and do something about it. We're team empowerment. We're talking about doing something. Notice, I haven't, I don't really, lately have not been posting too many videos of cops beating black folks up. I'm, I'm kind of past that right now. Because we have to start doing something about this shit. All right? I'm not, people send me videos every day of some black person getting beat up, black person getting abused by some white person or some Asian person. I really don't feel like posting that shit, to be honest. Because family, we need to start doing, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about the abuse other groups are levying against us? I'm all about the doing now. I'm not just going to be world star for abuse. Fuck that. We're going to have to start doing something. And the reason why other groups can abuse us with impunity is because they have a group base they think in a collective manner. They protect themselves in a collective manner. <clears throat> all the Asians get on code, all the whites get on code, all the Hispanics get on code, and they have an economic base where they can protect themselves from us while they abuse us. When we start talking about an economic base and doing things that's going to protect us economically and getting us into the mindset of creating economic bases on a regular basis, we on, we're the only group of people who have folks among us who look just like us trying to talk down on it. The reason why is because there's a lot of people who are afraid of power. And they use all these bad faith arguments and janky excuses because they're afraid of power. Our good brother, Dr. Amos Wilson, wrote a book talking about um, black empowerment and talking about how black people have been ingrained to fear power. We think that power is something evil. We, we've been downtrodden for so long and abused for so long, we think we're supposed to be abused. I really want us to get that garbage mentality out of our system. We start thinking we're supposed to be last. We're supposed to be deprived of resources. We're supposed to not have the means to do what we need to do. That's why whenever we start doing stuff and whenever you start doing stuff, notice you have a lot of other non-empowered Negroes who will start trying to talk down on you or trying to talk you out of it. Notice when other groups start talking about owning businesses, other groups immediately start supporting them. When they start talking about business ownership, or owning something, a real estate ownership, other groups get on code with them. They understand the importance of that. Black folks, as you know, when you start talking about empowerment, you start talking about your business ideas, yeah, there's always some mushmouth Negro in the corner hating on your ass. Usually it starts with a mushmouth nigga in your family. Let's keep it above. Unfortunately, we have defeated embarrassment type niggas all around us. This is why we have to create spaces for folks like you and I, where we can get together with other people who are about empowerment and we can talk about strategies on how to empower each other. It's very important to create these spaces. 
And it's very important to get away from those defeated Negroes. Family, other groups, when they want to build something, they understand the power of everybody contributing to the pot. They understand that. When we have the contribute to the pot mentality, there's always somebody trying to promote individualism. Well, that nigga got money. How come that nigga can't fund it all? We got that type of talk. We have that type of silly nonsense. Because these people are playing against us as a group, but we want to push that one person out there to let them take all the shots, to let them take all the risk, to let them take the fall, actually. Because, truth be told, a lot of these Negroes out here, they don't want none of us to be empowered. I want y'all to understand that. When you see naysayers always trying to shoot down any idea we have about building something, using all of their jive-ass excuses, they don't want none of us empowered. Because when one person is empowered, that's going to be, you know, that's contagious. You're going to, empower, you're going to inspire somebody else to be empowered, and then that's going to inspire somebody else to be empowered. So now a lot of different people are going to start empowering themselves in Team Goofy, Team twerking, team sipping on lean, all the, the niggas who like to play around bullshit, get high and fuck around, now they gonna be looking real funny style while everybody else is productive and these niggas are just laying around. So they know this. They know this. Family, I've been traveling all around the world for the last couple of weeks. I was just in Dubai a couple of days ago. I'm in the Maldives now. One thing I notice about these other groups, everybody's about business. Everybody is about handling business. There's a purpose. Everybody's handling business. Everybody's working as a group and they're handling business. Out here, the people are handling business here. They got the resorts here. They got private planes here. Even though they kind of finessing the tourists a little bit, they're still handling business though. When I was in the mall in um, Dubai, Beautiful architecture, beautiful structures all over the place. And that's one thing I was doing. I was studying the structures because I'm getting a lot of ideas for our museum. But over in the Maldives, it's all, not, I keep saying Maldives, over in Dubai, it's all business. The women ain't twerking. The dudes ain't sipping on lean. Fucking around. Everybody's handling business because they have a culture and a structure there where the bullshit ain't even tolerated. Over there in Dubai, you better watch what you say when you're on the internet. Let me be very clear. On the internet, you better watch what you say. Also, the women running around twerking in restaurants and all that, they, that's not happening. In fact, you can't even go into certain buildings revealing too much of your body. I mean, my kids or. We, they went swimming and we were going back into the hotel. They had, I had to go out and get a towel to put it on my son's shoulders because they wouldn't let the guys walk around with no shirts on. You know, you know what I'm saying? There's a standard there. See, we got to start having standards for ourselves. See, we in black society, we've been taught ain't no standards. We're the non-standard people. That's why all the, when people come around us, it's dumb shit time. We got to get that mentality out of here. We got to get that mentality out of here. Because the thing is, we're so dependent on the dominant white society for every damn thing, and we listen to them for cues on how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. We, we embrace ratchet nonsense and non-productive action, and we got to get that out of here. That's why when it's time to do some dumb shit, everybody signs on for the dumb shit. When it's time to go down to Freak Nick or Spring Break and everybody got their ass tooted in the air and sitting around drinking, smoking, and just wasting time, everybody's on board with that. Now, the minute we say, hey, let's build a museum, oh, hold on now. All of a sudden, the nigga who's drinking lean and smoking, all of a sudden, now he got an, a secret LLC that we don't know about. All of a sudden, he's, he had to take a detour from the Rock Nation brunch. All of a sudden, he had to cancel his phone calls with um, the Rockefellers. Now, all of a sudden, when it comes to black empowerment, all of a sudden, niggas turn into Bill Gates. The minute we want to talk about, who, who the hell is this? 
Hold on, man. Hold on. Someone at the door. Y'all bear with me one second. Hold on. Uh, hold on. Hey, but alright. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Remember, I'll be some some um, apple juice here. Sorry about that. Ugh. I'm like, who the hell is at this door? Okay, hold on, did I, lock, did I close the door? Hold on. There it is. I'm like, who the hell is at the door? They brought some, some apple juice. All right. Now, where was I? What was I talking about, family? Oh, yeah, I'm talking about anytime niggas like to party and bullshit, niggas will go out here, and I talked about this before. Hit that thumbs up button, hit that like button. We're going we're gonna to get heavy tonight. Yeah, you know what? I should have asked how much this was. I think my wife asked for some apple juice. I should have asked how much this was. This is probably $300. I should have asked. I don't even know if I should drink it. This is probably $300. I might have to go get me some damn apples off a tree. I have to borrow an apple from one of the bats out there and just crush that and drink it. Because it'll be cheaper than this. Man. But, um... <laughs> now, where was I? Hold on. All right. Make sure, yeah, the door is closed. The door is closed. But like I said, listen, a lot of Negroes are scared of empowerment. They're scared of power. So they hide that behind hating. Hating is usually an excuse to be immobile. See, people don't do anything for nothing. People don't do stuff just for no payoff. There's always some kind of payoff that people receive when they do something, even when they're hating. What the fuck are you hating for? What are you getting out of that? There is some kind of payoff, even if it's a psychological payoff. Why is this motherfucker hating, and you black, we're trying to get something going on, what is this person hating about? Usually, again, it's a person from a different culture who's hating because they want to see us replace and they want to see us fail. But also you have a lot of these, these embarrassment type Negroes who are afraid of power. They like white mommy and white daddy running stuff. And if black folks are up and running and getting things going, that means you, you don't have nobody to bullshit with no more. You see? Family, whenever you, and I'm talking to the, the, the everyday black family, whenever you wanna get something going on and you wanna do some constructive, and you got friends trying to talk you out of it or whatever, deep down, these are people who know they're gonna be in one place and they're gonna stay in one place because they're afraid to challenge the status quo. The minute you start talking about making real power moves and raising up and stepping your money up and stepping your game up and stepping your knowledge up, it's always that motherfucker sitting around eating a bag of pork skins. You know me doing all that, reading them books and shit. Fuck all that hotel here, nigga, it's turn up time, let's go to the club. Yeah. That's somebody who knows if you're elevated, you're going to try to elevate their asses. They know this. They know just by proxy, just by you being associated with them. If you get up, you're going to try to elevate them, and they don't want to get up. You better understand there's a lot of Negroes out here who are comfortable being into that embarrassment team. They're, they're perfectly fine being team embarrassment because that puts you into a childlike state. They understand that being perpetual children, they think, well, shit, I got it made. White people do all the work. I ain't got to run no store. The Asians and the Arabs run the stores. I ain't got to worry about no taxes and all that. Man, I just drink. I just get my little old check. And I just go buy me some Swisher Sweets and get me a bowl of um, um, Yoshinoya, get me some Chinese food, and then do me some TikTok videos, hit the club, fuck some of these hood rats. Niggas think they got it made. Just like on some parts of the plantation, there were some plantations where when you, when you read some of the slave narratives, you had some slaves back in the 1930s when some of those former slaves were talking about their experiences on the plantations, many of them were like, this is the worst thing ever. I never want to go back to that. 
That was the worst experience ever. I die before I ever do some shit like that. And then people always forget there were a lot of former slaves talking about, man, we sure had it made. I don't know what the big fuck was about. Master was good to me. We didn't have to worry about no medical. The, the master took care of us when we got sick. Master fed us. Master clothed us. I don't see what the problem was. There were niggas talking about they didn't see what the problem was. They thought, I got it made. Massa takes care of me. You have people really talking like that. They looked at themselves as just one, just a big old elderly child. And that's how the white supremacists used to address black folks. They used to say, hey, a grown ass Morgan Freeman looking nigga, hey, come here, boy. Or some elderly black woman, hey, come here, gal. Boy and gal. That's how they looked at us as big ass children. And then a lot of black people accepted that mentality. And those black people who were against that, who said, hey, I ain't nobody's fucking child. I'm a man, and I'm about to go after these white supremacists. Who's the first people who's going to challenge that? Oh, wait a minute now. Why are you going to mess with myself? Empowerment? What you talking about, man? Hush your mouth. Why are you talking about getting free? You going to get us all in trouble. Remember, when black folks start talking about empowerment, it was them coons and sambos who were comfortable with being in that position were the first people to, to talk down on them and try to sabotage their freedom. You understand? Oh yeah, they look at black people as big ass children. They've always looked at them like that and they used to portray black people as children. That's why when you look at those old Shirley Temple movies, they had Mr. Bojangles, old elderly black man, dancing with a little white girl because that was his equal. That, that was them saying this old plantation Negro, his equal is a little white girl, a child. We're gonna put him on the level of a child, yeah? So whenever we start talking about getting off that and being empowered, you got them scared niggas who's afraid of power who's going to try to throw salt at you. They're the main ones. Man, what you say? That don't sound like a good idea. Always just being contrary for the sake of being contrary. It was always those niggas. Team embarrassment, I call them. Now, these are the type of niggas, team embarrassment, these niggas will do anything for attention. They're twerking, drinking, talking, do, saying anything for attention. Everything becomes about attention. Attention is prioritized. And they'll engage in all types of degenerate be behavior, all types of disempowering behavior, as long as the non-black community is funding it. If there's drinking and smoking, they're, they're getting all their weed and their cocaine from the, the Hispanics, they're getting their meth from the Asians, you're getting all the other trash and junk from other groups, and you, you pay for that and you fund these other groups with glee. You have no problem funding these other groups. But the minute one black person says, hey, let's build something for black society. Let's build something constructive. Let's build something that's gonna kind of educate our folks, especially our young people. All of a sudden, the same nigga whose lips are purple from smoking weed, the same mammy who's been sucking white ass all day, the minute you start talking about empowerment, all of a sudden, niggas turn into CEOs. Hold on now, wait a minute. Hold on one second. Um, um, Jeff Bezos? Let me call you back. Okay, I got, I got another important um, issue to take um, correspondence to. Thank you so much. Now listen here. From what I understand, you're trying to get a black establishment going on. And first, I'd like to see a business plan. Oh, Lord. <laughs> then after I see that, um, we're going to have to take a gander at that plebiscite. The business plan niggas pop up which is always a bad faith argument. Anytime niggas start talking about, let me see a business plan, that's always a bad faith argument, okay? 
Let me see the blueprint. When niggas start, let me look. Any, let me, black people, listen to me. Whenever you get a business popping and you say you're trying to get something popping and niggas start talking about, let me see the business plan and the blueprint, that's a nigga who's wasting, not only wasting your time, that's a nigga who's passive aggressively hating. They ain't going to do shit. They're not going to help. They're not going to do any. Their purpose is to sit here, waste your time and antagonize you. They're just stalling to come up with a reason to hate on the shit. Well, I not well. First of all, who's all on the oversight committee? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Niggas just start making up shit. Niggas ain't got no, don't know nothing about no business. Wasting your time. They're they're procrastinating because they ain't gonna do nothing, and they're looking for an excuse to not do nothing. They're wasting your time, family. When niggas start talking, asking some random nigga, asking for random stuff about somebody doing a business, they ain't going to do nothing. They're not going to do anything. They're trying to undermine you. That's the only reason they're doing it. Now they want to get formal. Trying to use big words. Well, I need a, um, a business acquisition proposal. Well, shut up, nigga. Nigga learned three words in jail, and he been waiting to use those words. <laughs> Well, hold on now. I feel like this project is indiscriminately not cohesive enough. You heard what I just said? See, if you were on my level, you understand that. Niggas just been sitting around waiting to use three-syllable words. Don't waste time with that. Family, understand time-wasting niggas that are there to undermine you. Understand time-wasting niggas that are there to undermine your efforts because they don't want no power. Professional procrastination. You understand? Yes, but what is the mission statement um, set out to acquire? Shut up. <laughs> but I want black folks to understand this. We have to work for where we are. Look, don't let the professional plebiscite procrastinators throw you off. Don't let your dusty family members, because a lot of us have dusty family members who try to throw you off. Don't let your bummy buddies from school, or bummy niggas that you hung out with back in the day, don't let these folks detour you because these are gonna be some of your first naysayers, unfortunately. When you start getting shit popping or you try to get stuff popping, niggas who want to be in that same joint, that same location, they're going to start throwing shots at you. And understand, when you're working and studying and doing what you need to do, you're always going to have some people who want to leech off your power. Because, see, the minute you start talking about uplifting yourself and your community, you're already walking into power. And you have a lot of disempowered niggas out here who don't feel like they have their own power. They've been beat down and they've accepted defeat. But here's the problem. Because a lot of black people have accepted defeat, they know they, they don't have anything that they're going to do to acquire um, groups of people to acknowledge and respect their work. They know they're not going to do anything that's going to get that kind of respect. They've already thrown in the towel. Niggas who sit around smoking and drinking all day, those are the niggas who's thrown in the towel. They know, let me tell you something, this is why I'm hell-bent on all that drinking and smoking that we be doing. And, and, and some of y'all niggas take it to another level. All those crackhead niggas from the 80s and 90s, so you have a lot of them now sitting around hating. Them niggas who sat up while Black folks were out here productive. These niggas wanted to turn up and smoke crack and do all this goofy shit. And it's always your little crackhead buddy or crackhead relative trying to shame you into helping they dumb ass. No, you don't get what I get, motherfucker. Y'all better let y'all family members know, hey, it ain't that kind of party. I don't give a fuck if you my cousin, uncle, mama, daddy, whatever. When I'm out here working and grinding, you chose to sit here smoking that damn pipe. So... Yeah, I'm shining right now because I took the steps to shine. Folks who sit out here on the pipe, you don't get what everybody else gets. See, that's how life works. You understand? Let's talk real. Let's do some of that tough love here. 
all y'all ex addicts and all that, look, and I, some of y'all who are getting off the pipe, I feel you. I feel your journey. If you're getting off that pipe, that's a good thing, but let's be real clear. When you get off that pipe, you ain't gonna immediately all, you ain't gonna really walk into what a lot of your friends and relatives walked into when they were taking the necessary steps to get their shit right. When you get off that pipe, and then you get clean, all of a sudden you want all the great things that your other folks got, and it don't work, and then you get mad. See, a lot of y'all who have crackhead relatives and friends, they want to get mad at you. Hold on, you see I'm clean, and you up here doing all good? What's wrong with you? You see I'm clean. I've been clean, I've been off the pipe for three months, and you ain't doing nothing for me. It don't work like that. You don't get what we get. They don't get what you get. When you own the pipe, you don't get all the, the things that other people get who work for it. You're gonna have to start from scratch. Yeah? You're gonna have to start from scratch. Yeah, that's the first step. See, no. You gonna see when you do things, when you make decisions, that's the thing about decisions. You gotta live with them shits. See, that's how life works, folks. When you make a goddamn decision, you're going to have to live with that decision. When you start putting that pipe on your mouth, you got to live with that decision. Um, our good sister, Simone Biles, her mama was on the pipe. You know? Her mom, her biological mom was on the pipe. And see, that's another thing. And then you have a child. And your child and had to live with their grandma and all this old shit. And you out here on the pipe and then your child becomes very successful. Then you somewhere... I knew it. Now you somewhere want to do interviews and take that shine. You want to get some of that shine from the kid that you had to leave with your fucking grandma. No, sit your ass down somewhere. Sit your ass down. No, no, no. Don't do that. Sit down. And let the kid get that shine. Now you want to sit up here and be mother of the year. Yeah, and, and yeah, our, our sister Keisha Cole, her mother, that was very tragic. And I just didn't like the way they would put that sister Frankie on TV and kind of parade her around. And Keisha, you know, Keisha looked like she was trying to do her best to help her mother. And, you know, sometimes we enable a lot of behavior. You get a person like that who's on that narcotic and then you give them a spotlight and then you just kind of magnify the bullshit. Then it takes it to another level. See, a lot of times we shouldn't do that stuff. Uh, when we have people who got a problem and then you reward them with a lot of notoriety and I'm, I'm assuming her mother was probably doing appearances and getting money for appearances so you make them a de facto celebrity and you're making them a celebrity because they have a problem that magnifies the problem because you're rewarding the problem you understand and that's why a lot of people who are addicts and they are rewarded while they're addicts they end up dying Unfortunately, I have him with Rick James. With Rick James, he, he was, you know, kind of low-key for a while, for years, until the Chappelle show. When the Chappelle show came out and they did that skit with Rick James, Rick James was back up. Rick James was back up. Rick James became a household name after the Chappelle show, and what happened? Rick died not too long after that. You understand? Rick died not too long after he got back in the game with that Chappelle show thing. You know? Our brother DMX. You know? Yeah, Amy Winehouse. They knew she was an addict. She was an infamous addict. She kept getting rewarded. You know? Yeah, Rick James was a household name again. Rick James was back up. They, after the Chappelle thing, they would have Rick James hosting. Uh, I, I know he, would, he did some stuff at the BET Awards. and I mean, Rick was back up. Rick was up. They were about to go on tour. Rick was back up. But with somebody struggling with those kind of demons, that's not what they need until they get those demons under control. Yeah? Yeah, our brother DMX. DMX got back in the game right after that versus. That was a great versus they did. Right after that versus, DMX is back out here. His name is ringing again. He has a new had a new album coming out, and there it is. Yeah. So we better understand how this thing works. But black folks, 
we have to understand that the haters among us, that's going to happen. We have to play past that. Unfortunately, that's going to happen. We're going to have haters among us. But that's going to happen. But that shouldn't stop our journey to empowerment. See, we have to walk into the game knowing all the outside forces that are against us. Family, not only do we have, you know, little hate niggas and all that among us, we're playing past that. We have the white supremacists trying to hate on us. We got to play past that. And they're watching our every move. I did a live the other day on Instagram. And there was a white Hispanic dude. And I'm going to play some of the clips. We're talking about our museum, and then we got all, I had all these white supremacists popping in the room. I'm like, who are these people? What the hell, who are you people? So I had one guy get on live, a white dude, a white Puerto Rican. So me and him, we had a very interesting exchange. I'm like, let me find that real quick. Did y'all see that live, by the way? And by the way, y'all hit that link so we can get this thing up to at least 300K by the end of the broadcast today. Hit the link so we can get this thing up to 300K, we're almost at 280. Family, we can get this thing up to 300K. Family, there's 40 million black people on this planet, or in America, in America, there's 40 million black people. Let's say half the black people in America gave a nickel, five cents. If 20 million black people gave a nickel to this campaign right now, just a nickel, we would be right where we need to be. A nickel, you understand? 25 cent, not, not a nickel, five cent. Everybody gave, 20 million black people gave a nickel. So this is how easy this stuff is. We can get stuff done very, very easy. It ain't like we can't get it done. It's not like we physically can't do it or we don't have the resources. We're talking about pennies, guys. We can get stuff done with pennies. Literally pennies if we're just all on the same page. 20 million black people, half the black population in America gave a nickel. We would have a million dollars right now, a nickel. The power is us getting on code because other groups get on code and empower themselves against us. Now, I want y'all to listen to this ex exchange I had with this white Hispanic Puerto Rican dude. So he came in the room and I want y'all to, to study this. This is the study guide because he was low-key trolling in the room until he got on live and I calmly started breaking his history down and he was damn near about to apologize at the end. This is how you deal with these people. I want you, let, let's study this. This is a study guide right here. This is a study guide right here. Hold on, let me find it. Where are we at? Okay. Let's study this right here. Now listen to this. Okay, hold on. Let me... And my sister D. Tubman posted this on her page. Hold on. Now, this better not be the bussy, brother. We're going to get the white supremacists to come in and speak your piece. White supremacy does exist. You are proof that it exists. No, I did not take my children to get that. There's up. There you go. What's up, Mr. White Supremacist? Can you be a, a white supremacist if you're Puerto Rican or Mexican? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because 80% of the people in Puerto Rico identify as white. They list themselves as white. Of course you can. Yes. Now, now, now he, he, he can't deny it. Now, okay. Now, I want y'all to catch it. Let's break it down. Now, he didn't know I was going to hit him with that. See, this is why black people, it's very important to know history. It's very important to know history. It's very important to know sociology. When I hit him with that, because he knows I'm telling the truth. He knows I'm telling the truth. Because he was going to come in here with what they always do. They jump in the room and they start lying. And what happens is black people start believing their damn lies. Okay? Black folks, I really, really want y'all to stop believing everything these people tell you and learn history. Please stop believing. These people will lie at the drop of a hat. I'm talking about they, they will lie so fast and black people don't get that. They'll lie at the drop of a hat. So this dude, he was trying to think of a way to lie. He couldn't, okay? He knew I was telling the truth, so he was trying to think of a lie. <laughs> All right, now listen. Hold on, let me get back to it. Where are we? Where are we? Okay, hold on. Where are we at? Okay. Hold on, there we are. All right. 
All right. So why are you okay? So, Mr. Puerto Rican, we're in here talking about black issues. But what's what's your constructive reason to be in the conversation? A lot of white people like your stuff and follow your stuff and pay attention to what you're doing just because it's interesting. Uh, not yeah, haters. We're talking about black. We're talking about black empowerment. Okay. Chiming in, talking about white supremacy doesn't exist and all that. So are you? Okay. I want y'all to catch that what he said, which is what is true. What he said was absolutely true. Because he hangs, I, I'm assuming he hangs on all of those white supremacist websites like 4chan and all this stuff. And Minister Farrakhan brought this up many years. Minister Farrakhan, I'll never forget this. He said, the stuff that I'm talking and the stuff that we teach, white people will gravitate towards it before many black people. Minister Farrakhan said, hey, if we let white people all up in our meetings, they'd be the first ones in there. He said, we just don't let them all in there like that. Yeah. When it comes to some truth, oh, white people are there. I want black people to understand this. It's black people sitting around acting silly and trying to be contrary for the sake of being contrary. No, 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 no. White people, if there's some truth being told, white people are going to be there to listen. Good or bad. White people are going to be there listening for the damn truth. They'll try to troll to undermine you for, for telling the truth, but they're studying your ass. White people be there listening. Especially when we start talking about empowerment, white people are there listening, trying to see, okay, what are these niggas talking about? What are they about to do? That's why whenever, notice in my chat room or people like our good brother, um, Professor Black Truth and um, Black Empower, uh, um, the, the Black Authority, Notice whenever they start talking some real shit, the, the trolls just start flooding the chat room. The, the trolls, the white supremacists are in there, nigga, nigga, shut up. Um, um, we was kings. They, they start trolling like crazy. The minute we start talking about some real empowerment, that's when they come out heavy. Because they're always sitting around listening. Fam, I want y'all to understand black people. They study us all the time. They sit around studying black people all the time. That's what they do. I really want y'all to get that concept in your head. But let me play the rest of this. All right, hold on. Um, may, maybe I'm being, white supremacy. you know how it is. I'm sure I'm being a little overly aggressive and sarcastic. You know, I'm being a keyboard warrior, but I do think it's blown out of proportion so crazy. Like used as an excuse so much. And I think, I don't know, it's just, it gets old, man. I, I just think it's, it's sad. Okay, so this guy, his whole argument was, I just think y'all using white supremacy just gets blown out of proportion so much. So he's offended by the term white supremacy, okay? That's his whole argument. He's offended by us using the term white supremacy. Okay. You say like, black people, so go you ahead. Say black people you. So you said that it's an excuse for people to fail. Did you say something to that extent? No, but I think some black folks, not all, of course, but I think some black folks will always point the finger at white supremacists or some invisible white oppressor before they ever turn the lens on themselves. Oh, okay. So what's the problem that black people have that they need to turn the lens on? Well, uh, I don't know. If I, if I had to venture a guess, I would say fatherlessness, Okay. Moral character, you know. Okay, what well, moral character? So what? What? Okay, fatherlessness and crime, moral character. Okay, but you're Puerto Rican, and there's a crime rate in Puerto Rico that eclipses crime rates among Black Americans. So how come you haven't done anything? What's what's the moral character with the crime rate in Puerto Rico? Exact same issues, but I don't see Puerto okay. Ricans largely pointing the finger at the white folks. It's their um, problem. No, you. No, you're pointing the finger and coming over here to get around what foundational black Americans built. I'm supportive of the whole thing. I think it's awesome. Your movies, the, the, I think the museum is going to be an incredible idea. I'm supportive. I think most people are. Okay. But, but Even going white back to folks. Puerto Rico, but you say they're not pointing the finger at no white people, but y'all haven't done anything about the crime in Puerto Rico. I'm hearing this broad daylight jackings on a regular basis out there. The prostitution is off, off the chain. The Absolutely. Crime is I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure it is. But how come you have this is another thing, guys. Your culture. Stop letting people. Instead hold, of coming over here pointing at black culture, which we're trying to fix. This is okay, what we're look, doing. Me, this is what and this is why family always check these groups 
when they start talking about some damn black crime, always check them on their culture. See, the, one thing about white supremacist culture, they hate, they usually don't like to point out where their family immigrated from. A lot of the Anglo white supremacists don't like to do that. They, they like to forget that their family came from England when England was broke as hell or broke ass Ireland. They hate admitting that or broke ass Scotland. Scotland was broke as hell. Um, when, when their relatives came over, these were damn near destitute ass countries. That's why they had to leave Europe. So a lot of Anglo whites, they really hide their cultural lineage where they came from. They start at America. But some of these other Hispanic groups, you know, they'll acknowledge that they came from some Hispanic country. And yeah, that's when I like their ass up. The minute you, from a Hispanic country, start talking any type of grease about a foundational black American, man, if you don't sit your ass down, you can't say nothing. You can't say a goddamn thing about foundational black Americans if you came from any Hispanic country in the Western Hemisphere as crime written as it is. You can't say anything. And y'all black folks, stop letting them play that game on you. Check them on that shit. That's why history is very important. Why we're getting museums. This is what we're doing. We're trying to get things where we can fix our community. And you're jumping in our conversation, but you haven't fixed the issues in Puerto Rico, sir. Yeah, well, I mean, let's be realistic. Who's going to fix the issue in the entire community? I think an opinion is fair to share. I think everybody, everybody pays attention and offers their opinion on everything. I don't think you have to be gay to mention a gay issue. You have to be black to mention a black issue. I just think it's it's okay to make a, an observation without you know having to be a negative person or a hateful person or a white supremacist. Most people are not white supremacists. You know, I thought white supremacists were like, yeah, I'm a white supremacist, so what? White is right, we made everything. I mean, how come white supremacists don't those claim are, it? Those are, those are white extremists. Those are white extremists. And white supremacy exists because the white supremacists, the people who created the system of white supremacy, said that they were creating a system of white supremacy. That's their word. That's not our word. White supremacy is their word. And, they then, have, and this is very important, guys. See, we're learning here. I'm trying to teach everybody how to deal with these folks. We always stick to the term white supremacy. That's why we don't touch that critical race theory bullshit. Okay? That's why we don't go nowhere near that critical race theory, none of that stuff. You keep it on white supremacy because it makes them uncomfortable because white supremacy is their word. So that's where you get them. That's why they don't like us talking about white supremacy. It ain't like we made it up. That's your word. Y'all made that up. Y'all said you were white supremacists. You were the ones who still put up Confederate statues of white supremacists who said they were white supremacists. Y'all still do that. And it's hard for them to run from that. That's why they don't like you talking about it. Boy, when you start talking about white supremacy, they get, they get all bent out of shape. See, black people are afraid to talk about it. You, th there's a reason why I use this term all the time. I was one of the first people to get on national television, not just national television, international television, because I was all in the UK going on every network saying white supremacy, white supremacy, white supremacy. That's probably why they banned me out of the UK. I'm telling you, we got to keep using it. Our brother Neely Fuller taught us. We got to stick to that white supremacy word. When we start getting sidetracked with other words like affirmative action, which is an offshoot of what we're dealing with as far as white supremacy. Apartheid means white supremacy. Segregation means white supremacy. See, we throw in all these substitute words for white supremacy. And when they, when they throw a substitute word out there and then you jump on it, they got you. Because now you're getting away from the real problem. So when you start talking about segregation, well, we want integration. Okay, integration for you niggas. But you're still dealing with white supremacy under integration because what the hell is integration? Well, we integrate our money. Integration means basically we get to spend our money in white stores. That's really what integration means. You understand? See, we gotta be, we gotta be very particular about the words here. Okay? And that's why the word white supremacy gets them upset so much because that's their word and we use their word against them. And they can't run from it. Confederate statues all over the country of people who were promoting white supremacy to this day. So white supremacy is a very real thing. That's their word. You understand? It's not nothing that we made up. They badged it into our heads that they were white supremacists and white people are going to be supreme. You, you understand that? 
I, I can understand that. Okay, but, but going I'm, back to the fatherless thing, but uh, let's go back to the fatherless thing. You said another problem with black people is fatherlessness. Is that a, that's a problem with black people? What's well, a problem everywhere, but the numbers are high in the black community. I'm sure, that, I mean, so I know the you, government has a big thing to do with that. Democratic policy, welfare state. I well, mean, that's a, it's an issue that goes way beyond just the black community, but that's an issue there. Okay, look, and, and you- uh, You know I'm you gotta have a man in the house are, to raise those men. Uh-huh. I assume that you're right wing, right? You're a right winger. I, I see myself as right of center. Yeah. Right, right, right. And what's interesting, you're a right winger, but Trump went out there to Puerto Rico and disrespected everybody. He was throwing paper towels at you guys, at your people. But I don't think that's. I, I think that's. Uh, that's no big deal. I, who cares? I mean, I was so petty. You know? Yeah. Okay. Okay. See, that's that's the, the difference between you and us. See. You guys were victims of white supremacy to the point where you started to identify with your oppressors. So when they do something based on white supremacy, oh, it's no big deal. See, we like throwing paper towels. I mean, if he wouldn't have went, if he wouldn't have went there, they'd say, oh, yeah. he didn't even go. He went through some paper towels. You know, Trump, he's a freaking crass American. Definitely. So he, you know, that's it, his personality. Okay. People were there with their hands up. So he threw the goods. I think that I, I don't think that's the worst thing he's done. Oh, okay. And that's the difference between the way you guys view white supremacy and the way we do. See, we look at white supremacy as a big deal. We fight white supremacy. We're the only group that's constantly fighting white supremacy. You have to admit that y'all have been conquered by white supremacy. I don't and know who you, you mean by y'all. Who do you mean you by y'all, Puerto Ricans? White, identi white identifying non-Anglo Puerto Ricans such as yourself. You know, you I've never identified as white my entire life. Oh, that's never in my lie. life. Never. That. Uh, that's I can almost guarantee your paperwork says that you're white. Please don't lie, sir. Sweet. I can almost. One, sir, sir, stop it. Stop, sir. Your paperwork says you're white. Almost every Puerto Rican who comes over here, even the dark ones, um, put white on their paperwork as race. Let's don't. Never play in that my game. life. Never don't in my life. I, now, family, listen here. Notice he keeps saying, "Never in my life." I keep saying, man, your paperwork says you white. Never in my life. I've never identified as white. Never in my life. Okay? He keeps saying never in his life. Never in my life have, as I have identified as being white. Never, not on my, I said on your paperwork, no, never in my life. Okay? He keeps sticking to that. He keeps sticking to that. Hold on. I get insulted. Listen, <clears throat> when my black, when what my black friends... Okay, listen, no, no, stop it. Because they only have a couple of race categories. They have white, black, native, um, indigenous. They have three basic categories. Then I gotta click white, I have no choice. Boom. Now, well, yeah, I gotta click white because I ain't got no choice. So now he admitted it. I told you, now he said he ain't got no choice. He just went for, see, this is why, always assume that they're gonna lie, okay? First he said, oh, never in my life have I, I ain't never said I'm white. I ain't never put a no, never in my life, no, never in my life. It went from never in my life to, well, I ain't got no choice. I got to put white. <laughs> so it went from never in my life to now I ain't got no choice. <laughs> this is why when you know history and you know sociology, you can catch them in lies. Just assume they're going to lie because they always tell the same lies. Good Lord. <laughs> they, they all tell the same lies. It, white supremacy is war. Listen, family. White supremacy is warfare. I want, I want y'all to don't ever forget this black family. Please don't ever forget this black family. White supremacy is warfare. Warfare is based on deception. The book, The Art of War, states this. All warfare is based on deception. White supremacy is warfare. Warfare is based on deception. So always assume that the suspected white supremacist you're talking to is going to be deceptive. This is what keeps you two steps ahead of the game. The problem with black folks is you believe everything they tell your ass. When you believe everything the white supremacists tell you, you're done. People like us, the empowerment team, boy, you're going to have to show me a lot of proof before I go along with anything you say if you are a suspected white supremacist. Okay? 
Let me play the rest. Let me play the rest. But just like clockwork, we knew where he was going to go with it, and he lied just like clockwork. Hold on. And I have they, no thank you. Well, you could, you could choose indigenous. You could choose that, but you don't identify as indigenous. I click Hispanic. You don't identify as uh-huh. Hispanic is not a race. That's an ethnic group. But that's okay? a box. And they and specify I that on the census. They specify that on the census. Okay. Okay. Let, let me just say one. Let me just tell you one little thing about me. And I'm being totally honest. I swear on my daughter. Mm-hmm. My growing up, I always considered myself Hispanic. Right. A lot of my okay. And this is okay. Black family. Black family. This is another con. This is another con. When somebody says, "Well, I consider myself Hispanic," that doesn't mean that they're not white. Hispanic just means an ethnic white person. That's like somebody saying, well, I don't consider myself white, I consider myself Italian. Because people do try to play that role too. They try to say, oh, he's not white, he's Italian. It's the same thing. Hispanic, to them, is just an ethnic offshoot of whiteness. You understand? It's a different flavor of white. It's like saying, I don't like hot sauce, I like Tabasco sauce. It's the same thing, just with a different flavor. It's the same thing with just a spicier flavor. They love playing that thing. Hispanic means Spain. It means European. They view themselves as a European. They don't view themselves as an indigenous person or a black person, which most of them come from a black background. You understand? Hold on, let me play the rest of this stuff. And some of the audio kind of goes out, I think. So I'm gonna try to skip past some of it. Hold on, hold on. Friends, especially my black friends, and they don't think they just think I'm white. You know, it never came up. And when it does come up, when they're like, "Oh man, you white boys are always," I'm like, "You white boys? Why would you call me that? I'm Hispanic." And they laugh at me like, "Ah, Stop. you don't want to be white." They laugh at me. I don't like being called white. I never have. Stop. I think the Hispanics feel the same way. I honestly, it's no, they don't. No, they don't. Stop it. Stop it. They don't. They don't feel that way. In fact, when and I do. Oh God, my audio will be here to to be called white. Hold on one second. The initial conversation was you. Hold on. Let's see. Has it not? Okay. Now, I'm trying to fast forward to he got a Trump flag in the back. You know, it's been taken over by America. You mean by conquered by white supremacy? Hold on, because he has a Trump flag in his in the back. That's what I'm trying to I'm trying to get to that part. He has an actual Trump flag. He has a Trump banner in his house. All right, he's talking all this bullshit, but he has a Trump banner in his house. And I'm trying to go to that part. And the audio is kind of janky. Hold on. I want to go to where he has that Trump banner. Not just English, Spanish. You guys were conquered. Puerto Rico was conquered by the Spanish. Y'all think that you are offshoots of the Spanish Empire instead of the subjects and the defeated people of the Spanish. See, that's the thing. You think that you're Spanish. Okay, let me, do you ever deal with an individual you're talking to as an individual instead of immediately identifying them with their group? Because that's identity politics. That's why you know I'm- That's what they do to us. See how they start projecting? They always identify all black people as one big nigga. That's all they do. If one black person does something, well, that's just black culture, fatherlessness. He had all those talking points for black culture. But when we start doing the same thing to his ass, all of a sudden, dude, we're individuals, man. Can we just be judged by the actions of a couple of people, dude? They they don't like when you flip it on their ass. You see, they don't like when you put collective dysfunction on their group. But they love doing it to us. Oh, they love doing it to us. Remember, the the conversation, he's talking about all the crime and moral community, the moral character of black people and the fatherlessness of black. Oh, when when there's collective dysfunction they want to throw on us, we have to accept that. When we put that collective dysfunction on their culture, come on, dude. We are the world, dude. No, 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 no. You're going to get this work. This is why they don't like y'all learning history, black family. This is why they don't want you learning history. Because when you learn history, you start checking their ass. When they come to you with the bullshit, oh, hold on, um, Javier. You're from where? And you telling me about crime? And y'all out here doing carjackings and rapes? 
in, pan, in epidemic proportions in your community? No, you're not going to do that. This is why history is very important. But I wanted, I wanted to play where he had that Trump flag. Let me see, hold on. I'm right wing because I don't play the identity politics game. You're black, so you're part of a black group. You're white, so you and the white supremacist. You know, I don't do that. It's not nice. That's and inaccurate, that's an usually. Group. Right wingers are often identity groups, sir. They, they share the same ideology. They share. Ah, the audio. Okay, hold on. Everybody, just 100% all the way down the line? Okay, hold on. God damn, hold on. Because some of the audio, and that's why I had to stop broadcasting. Hold on, okay, got it. Is that a Blue Lives Matter flag in your house, bro? No, no, it's just a black and white American flag. Okay, that looked like I saw thing up there. Hold on. Ain't that man, he, he just, he tried to play it off like it's just a black and white American flag. That's them flags that them cops and those cop lovers be rocking. Them alt-right dudes be rocking those kind of flags. Hold on. All right. Oh, show your Trump sign. I saw a Trump sign. Was yeah, I got Trump a Trump flag on the ceiling. Trump flag. Yeah, Trump flag. flag. Okay. Okay, there you go. There you go. Okay, so you hardcore with it. You hardcore with it. Okay. I mean, I, uh, yeah, hardcore, you have a Trump flag? Yeah, yeah, you're hard. And that, that looks like one of the... Ah, the audio... Okay, hold on. No, it's just a black and white American flag. You talk about white supremacy when in. Hold on. It's the way, but I do have. I did have a. Oh, hold on. So mm. you know, maybe I was being a little bit of a jerk, but you know how people are behind a keyboard get stupid. So I apologize for that. Okay. Uh now, again, I'm fast forwarding something. I noticed he started low key apologizing when he saw it ain't gonna be no trolling. We're gonna have a real conversation here. We're gonna talk about your history, but I want y'all to catch this part. Oh. Okay, my audio, my thing is kind of messing up a little bit. I want y'all to catch this part right here. Catch this right here. When I asked about that black abuela, because I knew he had a black abuela. Hold on. Listen, listen. All right. There you go. I appreciate you giving but me the time, though. I'm, I am a big fan of all your movies and everything you do, so I appreciate you giving me the time. There you go. Are you going to, and then what you can do is donate to the museum. You can do that. I bought your do movies. I will donate to the museum. Good. And, do you, and oh, by the way, over there in Puerto Rico, do you still speak to your black abuela? Because I know you got one over there. There's a black relative over there in Puerto Rico. Do you still keep in touch with them? She recently passed away, but I do. Ha I did have a very dark abuelita out there. Who, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> yes, she did. Absolutely. But I God my, bless her. I brought my black friend to Puerto Rico. He started speaking English to her. He's like, oh, she's black. He started speaking English. She didn't know a lick of English. He's like, oh, my God, I thought she was black. Like, nah, man, she's 100 percent exactly. Exactly. All of y'all. Yeah, her her grandfather was black. <laughs> yeah, you called it on that one. All right. So even, All right, okay, now see that guys, even these folks are predictable, dude. Okay. These folks are predictable. See, when you know history, you you know how to handle their asses. He had to fess up to that black abelita. Got him. All of them got a black grandma somewhere in Puerto Rico or in them Hispanic countries, dude. They all got them. They all got them. And, they over here, and then come over here and be alt right than a motherfucker. His black friend thought that his grandma was just a black person. But she is. Listen to me, family. This is why you better know history. This whole white Puerto Rican shit started fairly recently. That white Puerto Rican shit, them trying to whiten up Puerto Ricans, that started really in the 30s and 40s. That's a new phenomenon. Puerto Rico was a black ass um, environment. You understand? That mehala la rasa, that improve the race, meaning whiten up the race nonsense, that's relatively new. See, this is why you better know history. You, and, and my heart goes out to this black lady who raised her, her children and grandkids to grow up running around here with Blue Lives Matter flags and all this old stupid shit. Yeah? Dude, that, that's, a, that's a conquered mind right there. That was a slave. Puerto Rico was a slave port. You understand? And they act like it wasn't. See, they, they play these little games with these Hispanic countries. 
in all of these little Hispanic countries, they play these little games as if it was just like some kind of Spanish um, resort. You understand? They make it seem like it was some kind of Spanish luxury resort that the Spanish would come and just to kick back to get some of the, 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 the waves and the vibes and the, the foods. No, these were slave ports where all of the culture is rooted from black society. You understand? All of these Hispanic countries. And then they would whiten them up a little bit later on. That's why they all fell to hell. When they start trying to get rid of all the black folks and breed them out, and, and in Argentina, they ran them out. Th that's why all of these Hispanic countries started going to hell. Once you got the root of the culture out, the black people were the root of the culture. That's when those societies started going to hell. You understand? It's heavy stuff, man. This is why we got to know history, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, everybody hit that, that hidden history museum link. Hit that hidden history museum link, ladies and gentlemen, so we can get this thing popping with the hidden history museum. Got a lot of folks in here. Hit the thumbs up um, thing, family. Hit the thumbs up button. Hit that thumbs up button. What time is it in the States right now? Because my time is all off. We're going we gonna to stay up a little bit so we can chop it up. I haven't chopped it up with you guys all week. Let's see where we are, family. We need to get to 300K by the end of the broadcast. We need to get to 300K. Let me see where we are now. So we get this museum popping. Okay. Let's get to 300K by the end of the broadcast. We can do this. We're going to do this our good, powerful black family. See, we're gonna have to learn how to get this thing going and we gotta stop depending on what I call MC Hammerism. When it comes time to us, for us to build some stuff, we got a problem with what I call MC Hammerism. Instead of us doing things and building things as a group, we try to get one person to do all the heavy lifting. See, the thing is when you invest in a project and white society understands this, when you invest in a project, your name becomes synonymous with constructive activity, even at, as a small contributor. Because now if you have a track record of contributing to projects that are prospering and thriving, you are looked at as a person who has a good resume. You looked as a person who will get involved with something constructive. So when you decide to do something as far as building a project, your name is already ringing out there positively, and then people want to invest in your stuff. That's why if you look at a lot of projects, I've invested in a lot of people's films projects, film pro like Spike Lee, his film project, I was one of the executive producers on one of Spike Lee's projects. Um, so many other people, my, my, my guy who did the Wilmington on Fire movie, I was a producer on that. I contributed finances to that. A lot of these projects we contribute to. And some of the people that contributed to some of my projects, you get your name out there as somebody who has contributed to projects when they get something going on. And remember, a lot of people that I contributed to contributed to my stuff. So we get a, it's a network, it's a circular thing. And everybody keeps building on that. See, that's how the Hollywood system was started. You had all these different groups of Jewish immigrants who came over and they were investing in each other's businesses contributing to each other's businesses, and, and they created a whole network with each other to protect themselves and to really build um, an economic base. Other groups know the importance of that. Even immigrants who come over, like Asian immigrants, they have something, I think they call it a key or something like that, where all of the people on the grassroots level will put their money in a pot and then give that pot to one person who wants to start a business. So they go to the United States with the pot money with the money in the pot that everybody contributed to, start a business, then they put some more money in the pot back home, and then they just keep doing that, and then let one other person go out there, then they get it popping. So there's a network of people who keep contributing to each other, and they got a network. They understand the, the importance of that. They understand the importance of that. When we try to do that, all of a sudden, niggas get into MC Hammerisms. Well, how come, nigga, how come you can't get LeBron James in them to just pay for the shit. 
You see? When we try to do the same thing, group economics, group contributions on a grassroots level, niggas start talking about, well, how come, how come Melly Mel can't do it? Just start naming anybody. How come Oprah Winfrey can't just pay for everything? Look, it would be nice if we do have them do that. I've said to athletes, hey, all y'all athletes and rappers, y'all should contribute. Where y'all athletes at? Y'all should contribute. The problem is, or not even the problem, the issue is we're not going to depend on them. Should they contribute to like the museum and all that? Yes. And I've openly said they should. Are we going to depend on them? No, because most likely most of them are not going to do that, and that's fine. You understand? That's perfectly fine because we got the, the power to do it ourselves. Family, we've raised almost 280K grassroots only. These are everyday working class black people just putting a little in. It's not going to, it's not killing you. It's not breaking your bank. Everybody's putting a little in. And that's really all it takes. I really want us to get into that mentality where we can just easily get stuff done. We can easily get stuff done without all the plebiscite talk and talking back and forth. Well, how come they don't do it? Look, some of the richest white people on the planet fundraise. Richard Branson, who's one of the richest white men out there. Richard Branson building rockets and all that. Richard Branson is always fundraising, always getting money from the public. On Twitter, he's always posting stuff. Hey, we got the Virgin Fund. Donate your money here. He's always doing that. Richard Branson is sitting on all types of paper. They understand the importance of the group getting involved. They just don't point the finger to the one person. These white people who are sitting on billions are always fundraising. Elon Musk is always fundraising. Yes, you can donate more than once. You can donate as many times as you can. We got over 6,000 people watching right now. 6,000 people, y'all give 200, we are where we need to be. If everybody in here gave 200 right now, we would be right where we need to be. Yeah, these are billionaires. So, the, so don't let no Negro tell you, well, how come you don't get, no, no, how come nothing? White people who are billionaires are always fundraising. You dig? How come you gotta ask us? How come you can't go to the bank and ask them? Whose money do you, when, look, when they say are niggas, and these are bad faith arguments, when you go to a bank to get some money, the bank is using your money anyway. They're using the money of the people. When you go to a bank to get some money to get a loan, when they give all these other groups bank loans, they're using your money. You know? So you're going to have to ask somebody for the money either a bank, which you're asking people, and they're using the funds of the community, uh, uh, an investment group who's using the funds of other people in the community. I choose to go directly to the community, especially the black community, so that we can understand how that works. Yeah? I choose to go right to the source, to the black brothers and sisters who we're going to empower. I don't want to go through no middleman. The bank is the middleman. They're using your damn money when they, and you don't even know they're using your money. Black folks, when all of these Asians and Arabs get their businesses popping, usually that's money from banks in your community. The money you put in, your money sitting up there working for all these other groups. You dig? They're flipping your money and funding all these other groups. That's your money. And then it's your money when you're their customers. They're getting money from you on the front end and the back end, dude. They're getting the money from the bank, which is your money, and then when they build the businesses, you go on him giving them your money all day, so you're funding them on the front end and the back end, family. And then when we say, hey, Forget a bank and all that shit. Let's just go to us. Let's all of us get our money together and just let's get this museum popping. Wait a minute. Hold on now. Hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, Mr. Bill Gates. Yes. Um, I have to. I have to call you back one second. I have run into an issue with some um, some Negroes. I, I shall call you back shortly to talk about um, the plebiscite that you and I were going to form. But hold on. Um, listen here. I was just on the phone with a very good friend of mine, Bill Gates, and uh, um, 
I heard a, a little something about this museum thing you got going on, and um, I heard you're trying to build it in the black community. Now, what you need to do, first of all, I would like to see the um, city permits um, before I make a sizable contribution. Then I would like to see who's going to be on the zoning board. After I find out who's going to be on the zoning board, I'm going to need their social security numbers to really make sure this is a legitimate endeavor. And um, shut the fuck up, nigga. Shut your butter biscuit eating ass up. <laughs> Time wasting nigga who ain't going to do nothing. These niggas about to waste your time. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You give the banks all your money, and when you want to go get a loan, they jiving around with the loan money. They, you can't get a loan, but they give it to a motherfucker who done came over here with no paperwork. <laughs> they say your credit is jacked up because you can't get a loan, or you don't have established credit, and you've been living here for, for eight generations. But then somebody came over here on a boat two months ago with no paperwork, all of a sudden, they got a brand new building on Crenshaw. Yeah? And niggas want to question why we're trying to organize our money together to get this thing popping. Man, we, we don't have the luxury to hate. We don't have the luxury to hate. You understand? But like I said, a lot of folks get into what I call MC Hammerisms, meaning they want one black person to do all the heavy lifting and they want them to do it in bad faith. Not that they want them to do it so that everybody can be empowered. They want the one black person to do all the work so that one black person can fail. These Negroes know putting one black person out there to do all the hard work up against a group of other people who are working as a team against us, they know they're setting up that black person for failure. Let me say that again. They know when you push one black person out here to do all the work and to take all the hits, you're setting the black person up for failure. Because number one, if that one black person was to fund all this stuff, what does that mean for the group? The group don't really get no gain from that. Because if that one black person dies or whatever, something happens to him, we're back at square one. The name of the game is to get us in the mindset of the everyday black person all contributing to certain projects to get it done without depending on one particular person. See, we got to stop depending on one particular person to get stuff done. We all got to get into the mindset. We can all get it popping. But see, I call it MC Hammerism because see, our good brother MC Hammer, we don't really give him enough credit, and I think what was done to Hammer was very wrong. Hammer was a good-hearted person, and still is a good-hearted dude from what I understand, real solid dude, and Hammer came from the hood of Oakland, and when Hammer got very successful, as a black person, his type of success in the hip-hop genre was new. I want y'all to understand, when our good brother Hammer got it popping late 80s, early 90s, his level of success, his crossover success for a black hip hop artist was unparalleled. No other black hip hop artist took it to that level. So what people did, they started hating on Hammer under the guise of him doing for the community. So, oh, come on, Hammer, lift all of us up. You got to keep it real. If you're from the hood, Hammer, you if you ain't no sellout, you got to take all of us with you now. You better... You better do something for the whole community. So Hammer, in good faith, thinking that that was a real argument, that wasn't a legitimate argument. That was niggas hating. So Hammer started trying to literally take everybody out the hood. Up in Oakland, Hammer would take all these people on tour with him, give all these people jobs. I mean, he's taken a couple of hundred people all around the world with him. And that, that's what depleted a lot of his resources. That, that depleted a lot of our brother's resources and after a while the brother had to file bankruptcy because you're trying to lift up all these people and, and at the end of the day, they didn't really appreciate it. People now, yeah, they use those shaming tactics against Hammer and people still don't give Hammer the appreciation he needs after he sacrificed so much of his resources. They don't give Hammer the respect he needs. Hammer, man, was one of the first people doing those big commercials Hammer had those big endorsements and they were shitting on Hammer. Oh, that nigga selling out. Now everybody's doing it. 
Everybody's getting endorsements now. Everybody's doing commercials now. So niggas was just hating just because that brother was the first one to get it popping like that. Getting into these bad faith arguments so that he could lose and get down a peg. You understand? Hammer's always been a stand-up dude. He's always been a stand-up brother. You understand? So they try to shame cats. Yeah, man, Hammer would take all those people on tour with him. Hammer had hundreds of people. He was on his payroll, man. And man, going on the road is expensive. Man, we went on the road. We did this, uh, uh, we did our Mink Slide concert down in Atlanta. Hell, we had a what? How many people we have in the band? About ten people. Nigga, that was a headache. Just going down there. Just flying everybody out and getting everybody's hotel. And God damn, we had like 10 people that was a headache. This dude had hundreds of people. So I can imagine. Yeah? Yeah, but people tried to shame my brother Hammer. Yeah, he bounced back. And Hammer still, from what I understand, he's still doing his thing. You know, I think he's still touring. The whole shebang. But we got to give our brother his props and his flowers when we got to, when he's here. They were hating on that brother unjustly and Hammer opened a lot of doors, man. Hammer opened a lot of doors and did a lot for a lot of fucking people and they don't give that brother the respect that he deserved. Yeah, he had a cartoon and the whole shebang. Yeah, that brother had busloads of people. You yeah. think? So we gotta understand that. And speaking of rappers, by the way, these people are still trying to use these bad faith arguments going after the rapper the baby. They're still trying to talk crazy. See, that whole thing about the baby trying to say that he said homophobic stuff, which he didn't. The baby didn't say anything homophobic, but remember, part of white supremacist culture is lying on black people. And it's very important for them to promote the lie heavily. This whole thing about them just really going overboard, trying to criticize the baby, the fact that they're going so overboard with it, I think Lollapalooza, they took him off some of the, the shows that they got coming up, so they took them off. There was a show in the UK, they had to take them off of that. So part of white supremacist culture is getting together and lying on black people. The problem is you got so many cowardly Negroes who go along with white supremacist culture with lying on black folks, which may, makes you a shameless Sambo. And watch some of these other so-called A-list white people like the, the John, not John, Elton John, Madonna, came out talking about the baby and all that. And I talked about that a couple of days ago, how she was condemning him for his homophobic remarks. Madonna can kiss an ass. Madonna can go to hell. First of all, our brother Michael Jackson told us Madonna wasn't shit. Go Google that. Our brother Michael Jackson, back in the day, he said he hung out with her. He said she's a witch. He said she wasn't about shit, okay? Michael Jackson tried to warn us about Madonna. And don't forget, Madonna got, got those adopted black kids, the little black boy running around the house switching, her, one of her doc, adopted black kids switching around in a dress. You understand? But listen, don't forget about Madonna. Remember when she had to apologize? See, a lot of these people are using this baby thing to attack him as a smokescreen to hide their own anti-black racism. Madonna don't need to say nothing. Remember, Madonna had to apologize for using a racial slur on Instagram, talking about this nigga trying to be cute. She thinks just because she done fucked a bunch of niggas and she done, done adopted some black kids, she can get up here and talk all um, slick like she did. So she had to apologize a couple of years ago for saying nigga on her Instagram. So yeah, Madonna ain't shit. And any of y'all Negroes co-signing these suspected white supremacists for going after black people unjustly, you niggas are enemies of black society. See, this whole thing of them attacking the baby and Negroes getting involved. See, Negroes love attention. We got this problem with Negroes trying to get attention. Attention culture is a very bad problem. We got a culture of Negroes desperate for attention. And before I go into that, let me, let me get into this. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. But no, I'll show this later. These chicks twerking. But I'm, I'm talking about the attention whoring thing. I'll play that in a second. But we got a problem with attention. Attention deprivation. So many black people are told that we're invisible, 
Sometimes our parents aren't there to raise us like we need to be raised. So black people are walking around here. So many black people are so desperate for acknowledgement, especially from a white person. We're desperate for attention. So we just do or say anything just to get some damn attention. Even if it's stupid, even if it's negative, as long as somebody's looking at me, I'll be a part of it. And then you have these Negroes sitting up here attacking the rapper baby because they know that it's going to get attention from white people. They're going to get some brownie points from white people, especially these black folks who are talking about their LGBT. See, they think because they are laying up with white people, they have some kind of um, sexual camaraderie that makes them equal to white people on a social level. And it makes them feel like they're not subject to the system of white supremacy based on their sexual intersectionality. And I want y'all to hear um, Raven Simone. She's sitting here with her white wife up here talking about the rapper DaBaby. Okay? This is Raven Simone sitting up here with her white wife talking about the rapper DaBaby and his comments that weren't even homophobic. But I want y'all to peep this. Listen to this. Hold on. Peep this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where we at? Where we at? Because this is what, whenever these Negroes are sitting up here talking about the baby and all that, this is what it's really about. They're, they're, they're being puppets for their white mates. Listen. I think that those comments were inappropriate. I'm just gonna leave it at that. I think that there are people- Lily Raven's shaking her head like a mammy. Who are answering and speaking on it much more eloquently than Ooh. either of us could do so right now. But basically everybody from Elton John to Demi Lovato to, to the people the of Pose. Yeah, have commented on it. And I think that um, it was rude and disrespectful. Yeah, and he might need to educate himself a little bit. Okay, white woman. Um, my thing is this, and black folks, stop being cowards when it comes to dealing with these people. See, that's why they got Raven there, so Raven can do the talking for her little white mammy, um, her white mommy. First of all, Elton John, this white woman here, Madonna, none of these people said a goddamn thing about Ed Buck. Don't talk to me about what the baby said that wasn't even homophobic. He wasn't even talking about nobody. He never mentioned any um, AIDS as far as a gay person. The baby didn't say anything homophobic, but y'all got all of this smoke for the baby, but y'all ain't say nothing about Ed Buck and them dead black men coming out of Ed Buck's house. Y'all no, don't say shit about what somebody need to do. See, they can attack a black person, but they can't defend black people who are victimized by the white people in their community. That's them being on code. That's white people being on code. Y'all, none of y'all had that smoke for Ed Buck, whose trial just happened last week. Nobody ever spoke up for the victims of Ed Buck, the gay victims of Ed Buck. None of them spoke up against it. But you got all the smoke for the baby. That's them using that as a smoke screen. And any Negro sitting around co-signing this, you are a cowardly Sambo. You're a coward. These white people are on code, white, gay, and white, straight, are all on code, and y'all Sambo niggas are sitting up here co-signing their racist code. They're practicing white supremacy. That's how white supremacy works. That is how white supremacy works. When they criticize black people, what's up, look at this, hold on, let me show you my lady. What's up, Lexi? What the boys doing? You getting water for the boys? Is, is, who, what's Tao out there yelling about? Okay. Okay. You know, kids out there yelling. Okay. Now, what was I saying before my queen came up in here? <clears throat> but yeah, don't, let, don't play that game. These people are practicing white supremacy. But look, let me play the rest of this with Raven Simone. I want y'all to catch what she said here, which was very, I thought this was a very interesting thing. This lets you know the mentality of these black people who are clicked in with the LGBT. Hold on. And think before speaking. And then I also look at it as, you know, people like to say things to get a rise out of people because you might not have said their name out there, out of your mouth in a while. And now you're saying somebody's name. So, you know, a lot of people do stuff for shock value. It's gonna see it. It's gonna be interesting how he pulls back from this because our family, our community is strong in numbers. And when we combine, things happen. 
Okay, now what you mean, our family? What she's trying to say is our family, meaning us in the LGBT community. Okay, Raven, let me play that again. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, our, our family is strong and with our numbers. Okay, um, Raven, you're a, you're a mammy for the LGBT community. What family? These people ain't your fucking family. She's up here talking about her family, meaning the LGBT community. No, your family is only good to you as you can, if you can attack another black person. That ain't no family. If your family is only backing you up when you can attack other black people, well, let me tell you something, sis, that ain't your family. Your family wasn't there for black people who were LBGT and died at Ed Buck's house. Hold on, that's a very interesting thing she said and when we combine hold on, hold things on. with your mouth in a while and now you're saying somebody's name so you know a lot of people do stuff for shock value it's going to see it it's going to be interesting how he pulls back from this because our family our community is strong in numbers and when we combine things happen so yeah. you know we'll see about that but i think that people yeah things happen like they get resources and you don't should take if they want to just say things that are for shock value. Um, okay, shut up, Karen. Shut the, man. Shut up. Okay? This is cowardly as far as I'm concerned when black people sit up here and you think, and this is why a lot of these black folks think because they're laying up with a, a white same-sex partner that they're part of the damn LGBT community. Raven, I hate to break it to you. The white LGBT community look at you as a lackey. You are not an equal member of the white LGBT community. You laying up with that white woman just makes you another subject of white supremacy. Things happen like what, Raven? When y'all get together, things happen. You can't get a goddamn thing happening unless them white supremacists in the LGBT community gives you a pass. You can't get a job unless they give you a green light. You're still under the subject of white supremacy. Remember, Raven Simone was like, I'm just American. I don't want to be black. I'm just American. I'm just American. Remember she was on that bullshit? See, they can tokenize your ass. Hold on, let me, I'm going to find that clip. See, they tokenize these Negroes and they think they're special. Hold on. Hold on. Let me, hold on. Hold on, let me don't let me let me jog y'all memory for a minute. Hold on. Let me jog y'all memory. Hold on. Hold on. Let me play okra for a second. Hold on, hold on. The tweet was, I can finally get married. Yay, government. So proud of you. Hold on. Wow. That was August 2nd, 2013. So was that your way of coming out? Was uh, of saying you were gay? That was my way of saying I'm proud of the country. But yeah. I will say that um, I'm in I mean, an amazing, happy relationship with my partner, a woman. And on the other side, my mother and people in my family, they've taught me to keep my personal life to myself as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I so um, I try my best to, you know, hold the fence where I can, but I am proud to be who I am and what I am. So when did you know who you were and what you were? In that topic of dating and in love, I knew when I was like 12, I was looking at everything. <laughs> Were you I looking just, at boys and girls? Yes, ma'am. Did you have a word for it? Because I think when you're younger, you don't even have language for what it is. I don't, I, don't, I don't need language. I don't need a categorizing statement for it. I think that's one thing that kind of- So you of, don't want to be labeled gay? I don't want to be labeled gay. I want to be labeled a human who loves humans. I'm tired of being labeled. I'm an American. Mm -hmm. I'm not an African-American. I'm an American. Oh, girl, don't, don't set up your Twitter on oh, fire. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. I mean, what? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> what did you just say? Stop, stop, stop the tape right now. Okay. I will say this. What? I mean, I don't know where my roots go to. Mm -hmm. I don't know how far back they go. I can't go on, you know, I don't know how far back, and I don't know what country in Africa I'm from. But I do know that my roots are in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I'm an American. And okay. So she was using... African to substitute black, okay? 
That's what she meant. Because see, when we say, because I don't use the term African American either, but I use the term black. I'm a foundational black American. But see, let me tell you what she was saying. Let me show y'all what she was saying, okay? She's saying, I'm not black. I'm LGBT. I've transcended black. You understand what I'm saying? She's saying, I'm not African or black. I'm LGBT. I've transcended black. She don't want to be labeled, but she's, she's LGBT. She just labeled herself. She's talking about the LGBT community and how strong they are. You see, she doesn't, she's not a part of no black community, but she's a part of the LGBT. Well, we're, we're so strong, we're powerful. Our family, we're, our family is powerful. You see what I'm saying? When she talks about the LGBT community, oh, we're so powerful, we're so strong, we can make some things happen. I'm not black, I'm OJ. Yeah. <laughs> These folks think that sexual access to white people makes them something other than black. That's why they sit up here co-signing shit. Yeah, the baby, damn that, the baby, you so wrong for that. These Sambo niggas, that's why they want niggas to be bussified and buck broken. They want that because they know once they buck break them, these niggas are not going to be about no type of empowerment. See, family, we're, we're in a battle. Team empowerment versus team embarrassment, ladies and gentlemen. And it goes from different levels, from the top to the bottom. We have embarrassing Negroes out here in Hollywood. We have embarrassing Negroes working in the mid-level sections. We have embarrassing Negroes in the hood rat dusty nigger sector. That brings me to this video here. There was a restaurant up there in um, Henderson, Nevada. They were having Sunday brunch. There was a Sunday brunch, and let me, before I get into that, speaking of embarrassing Negroes, we have embarrassing Negroes on a political level, like this right here, before I get into that video. We still have the Sheila Jackson Lees out here. They're still going out here getting arrested. This is Sheila Jackson Lee, by the way. This is embarrassing. These, they're doing all of this unempowering, embarrassing nonsense. This is Sheila Jackson Lee. I engaged in civil disobedience today in the spirit of John Lewis in front of the Senate building, and I was arrested. Good trouble. Stop. Hold on. And I was arrested. Hold on, listen. Yes, I engaged in civil disobedience today in front of the Hart Building in Washington, D.C., and I was arrested. I believe when you're getting into good trouble, when you realize that the 15th Amendment has guaranteed the fundamental right to vote, any action that is a peaceful action of civil disobedience is worthy and more to push all of us to do better and to do more. Okay, so they out here, they're still doing these phony ass arrests. It's embarrassing at this point. These niggas, and they know it's embarrassing, but that's the only card they got to play, family. Family, we're in a war. Black empowerment family, I want y'all to understand, we are in a war. It's us, not only against the white supremacists, but they're embarrassing ass minions. Who, who's gonna win this war? Team empowerment and team embarrassment. They're still doing these embarrassing ass um, con job gestures. That's the only play they got, man. This is, for, this is for them to get voting rights for immigrants. It ain't even for us. See, they want to try to pull on our heartstrings so that we can co-sign it. It ain't for us. That's why we ain't co-signing it. That's why these little gestures and publicity stunts, they're falling flat because we ain't going for it. All that good treba. Family, there's a reason why I want to have a museum that ain't on the good treba talk. Because, see, when you get money from them to do a museum, your museum is going to have to be full of good treba. That's why all the little black museums that we see is good treba. You got your ass whooped and got in some good treba and good white folks save you now. We got embarrassing Negroes everywhere we go. And, then, and, and again, like I said, up there in this restaurant, they were having Sunday brunch up here in um, Nevada. People were having Sunday brunch and some hood rats came in there and some hood rats just started twerking on tables while people in there eating brunch. Some hood rats came in 
and just hopped on tables and started twerking. I want y'all to look at this nonsense right here. And I saw another video where somebody, they were twerking at a damn funeral. Hold on. Hold on. Look, look at this right here. This is at a Sunday brunch in a restaurant in Nevada. Hold on. <laughs> So this woman had, one woman got her ass on the table and another woman got her face all in her ass. I mean, come on. Okay, family, now, family, Listen, this is what we're up against. See, these are minions of white supremacy. Now, let's be very clear. This does not represent the black woman, but we do have a hood rat problem, and part of the hood rat problem is attention deprivation. We have a problem where people are so desperate for attention. You'll do anything for attention. These are people, these hood rats. These are hood rats whose fathers weren't around. Listen to me. Listen to me. And look at them shapes. All of them, notice all of them look dusty. They, uh, their shapes, some of them bad built. You know, they might have ass, but the, the gut hanging over, they just bad built, looking like a PT cruiser with box braids. Um, just all over the place. But you got hood rats out here, family, who are defeated. Psychologically, they've been conquered. And the white supremacists, they like hood rats like this. Even though they don't like hood rats being around, they like the existence of hood rats like this because they know hood rats like this raising black children, those children are doomed. They understand if this is gonna raise kids, the kids are done. They might as well get the prison ready now. That's why they start looking at stats they start looking at, at, at school records to see, okay, these hood rats are raising these kids and they're raising them fucked up. We might as well build a prison right now because in 20 years, we're going to need them. We're going to make some money because we're going to have these prisons filled in 20 years with these hood rats raising these kids. Okay? They know that. White supremacist society, they create hood rats like this. They incentivize hood rats like this. Okay? They already know. We're in a battle against that. Hood rats don't want us to be empowered. They, they don't mind embarrassing themselves because they're getting attention. They know that when children are being raised, ain't no father in the home, the mama was somewhere working, so you got these kids sitting in the house by themselves being babysat by BET, that's why they make sure it's some bullshit on TV. They know these kids are going to be home. You understand? They know the kids are going to be home by themselves, especially in the hood or wherever. They know that black kids are going to be home by themselves, so they want to make sure the television is filled with bullshit. You're going to put Raven Simone on there. That's why they got Raven Simone all on TV, talking her dumb shit. Then you're going to have, they got her on The View or whatever the shows are, or whatever, the, whatever shows, Disney, all that. With her dumb shit. You got Lil Nas X all on TV. So when your kid is at home, they get to see Lil Nas X. and They get to see a bunch of bullshit. But even back in the day when these hood rats were being raised, um, 106 in Park, booty shaking video, that's all they saw. You be, you're being raised by hood rats. You're being raised by ratchetness. You understand? Ain't no parent. Nobody's giving these people no attention. So they think when these kids are sitting at home by themselves, in order for me to get attention, I got to do the shit that I saw on BET. In order for me to get attention, if, in order for me to get somebody to acknowledge me, because every image of me, of a black person I saw on TV who was my babysitter, every image I saw was a motherfucker twerking, eating somebody ass out, 
or doing something ratchet. So I have to do that in order to get attention. You think? So when we start talking about education, history, empowerment, what the hell? You're talking a foreign language. You're talking white folk language right there. When we start talking about building something, hey, let's build a museum. What? What the hell is that? That's when we get pushed back. You understand? These are the folks we get the pushback from. Now, they got all of that, that Asian store hair that they done spent two and three thousand dollars on. Proudly, they'll proudly spend two and three thousand dollars on them damn bundles at the Asian store and ask one of them to put fifty dollars on the black museum. Fuck out of here, nigga. They would curse you out. And the dusty Negroes that fuck hood rats like that will cuss you out too. You dig? These people have no problem embarrassing themselves. Why? Because even though I'm embarrassing myself, that means people have to look at me in order for me to embarrass myself. So as long as I'm being looked at, I'm winning. That's that mentality. As long as somebody is acknowledging my sad existence, that's good enough for me. That ain't it, family. Black folks, we have to get out of this thing where just the fact that we're being looked at, that's, we can die in peace now. We can't be that low in the game to just prioritize getting attention. Dignity be damned. Just acknowledge that I exist and I'm good. Not nothing that I achieve, not nothing that I accomplish. Just look at me and look at the dumb shit I'm doing. Now I feel like I'm a human being. Everybody wants to be acknowledged for something. There's nothing wrong with that, but you get acknowledged based on the contributions you bring to society. That's why in hood rat culture, what do you see them long, bright colored braids? I see pink braids, green braids with big ass caterpillar eyelashes. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Nose ring, tongue ring, gut sticking out, ass in the air with all types of hydro gel shots in it, acrylics in you. Know, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's all about look at me. I don't have anything else to bring to the table, so just look at me. Yeah? That's what it boils down to. We got to be better than that. We got to be better than that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a civil war and it's up to us, the empowerment side of the game. We got to be on code heavy against this. Again, we have so many enemies so-called within. We have enemies without and we have enemies within. And hold on one second, let me show y'all something because Talking about the museum, you know, we got dusty niggas and hood rats trying to talk down on it. We got the white supremacists calling up, trying to throw salt on it. Hold on. Let me show y'all something. Where's this thing somebody put up? Hold on. Where is this? Somebody... I'm trying to find that tweet. I was talking about, hold on. Hold on one second. I was talking about the museum and some suspected white supremacist put up something very interesting and I, I can't find that tweet. Hold on. Where is this dude? I'm trying to find the tweet. I was, um, where's this dude? We were talking about the museum and um, some white supremacist was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, everybody contribute to the museum. And he was like, well, I'm trying to save my money to burn it down. I'm trying to find that tweet. They probably got him out of here. They probably got him offline. But I want to find that. It was like talking about low key. They already talking about trying to burn some shit down. That's why we, we're prepared for any of that stuff. Yeah, he was like, yeah, I'm going to save my money so I can burn it down. I wish you fucking would. 
Boy, I'm telling you, we're going to be real prepared for that. We're going to be very, very, very prepared for that. But again, this is why we got to be on code and start looking out for each other. This is why we got to be on code and start looking out for each other because, yeah, they're already trying to throw in some little old lightweight threats. But again, we have so many other groups that we got to battle as far as us, the empowerment community. Not only do we have to battle the white supremacists, we have to battle the, the dusty um, Sambo class and the hood rat class and the boule class and the political class. We also got to battle that damn immigrant class, the immigrant coon class. Not all, because there's a lot of immigrant brothers and sisters who own team empowerment with us, but we got to acknowledge the coon class that we got to battle too. Family, recently, the immigrant coons were attacking Foundation of Black Americans based on the Olympics. Um, some Jamaican women won one of the relay races. I'm not sure which one it was. It was some Jamaican women who won. And instead of just celebrating the Jamaican women winning the relay race or whatever they won, the whole conversation turned into Shikari. They started using those women winning to not just attack Shikari. Shikari, remember, she's become a basically, she's become basically a proxy for black society. Who, who, who the fuck is this coming on over there? No, 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 no. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. I see some people walking up in my thing. Okay, hold on. Okay, I'm just looking. Yeah, I made a tweet. I said, look, Oxtail Twitter, and o the Oxtail Twitter went viral. I called them Oxtail Twitter. But they were up here, a lot of these Caribbeans started taking shots at us talking about Shikari. Talking about, yeah, Shikari would have came in last. Yeah, Shikari would have been eating the dust. I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Shikari didn't even compete. Shikari didn't even compete. The Jamaican women won, so instead of just celebrating their win, y'all use that energy to throw salt on the sister, the American sister who wasn't even in, in the game? So they use that as an opportunity to just start shitting on the American sister who wasn't even competing and to just shit on all of us. Yeah, we the best, yeah. We the best, we the best. Then they start talking about, yeah, the, the food in Jamaica, we got more energy. Look, um, the sh Safari, Nicki Minaj's ex, he started talking about how the food in Jamaica is so much better and they got healthier food, which is, yeah, the food is healthy in Jamaica. I agree with that, but what does that have to do with anything? Then I heard Nicki Minaj kind of took a low-key shot at Shikari. So they're talking about Shikari would have lost if she ran. The fuck y'all talking about? <laughs> so Shikari wasn't even in the competition and they used the Jamaicans winning to attack Shikari. They were, y'all, I'm like, y'all really doing this? Y'all got this much contempt for foundational black Americans? Because that's what that was really about. That was really them. We're in front of mind. They want to be able to say they beat us. We're the ones, not the European countries, anything. They want to say that they whooped a, 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 a foundational black American. Yes, I called them oxtail Twitter. Boy, they got mad. And like, I give a damn. And then they start lying about hip hop. Well, your Oxel Twitter created hip hop. No, no, you didn't. We didn't. We didn't went down that road and debunk that bullshit. We didn't debunk that already. So let's not even start that game. Somebody said some real disrespectful. I, one one brother said, "Yeah, they ran the relay because they're used to fleeing their country." Now, I didn't say that, but that was that was disrespectful. He took it too far. That brother took it too far. But I did say Oxel Twitter. <laughs> Oh, they got mad when I said that. Oh, you xenophobic. No, I'm not. I'm calling y'all out for the bullshit. Y'all use that as an opportunity. And look, let's be clear. Black people, we're pretty much damn near black, black people and black viewers and black um, um, athletes damn near are boycotting. We're having a de facto boycott of the Olympics based on all of the fuckery going on. We ain't even tripping on the Olympics like that. But just the fact that their people won and instead of celebrating their victory, they use that as an opportunity to turn on 
a foundational black American and just shit on black Americans. And see, what happens is y'all want, a lot of these folks, they want to be able to shit on us. And when we start checking them, then they want to cry foul. See, when we start getting on their ass and checking them, see, they want to sit up and just throw shit on us all day and how we ain't this and we ain't that and we lazy and we are cotters and we Yankees and all. They want to shit on us all day. And the minute we start checking them and reminding them how your home country look, oh, nigga, you're Zina, full back. Then all of a sudden, Bamba Clyde, we all came on the same ship. No, we all black. No, when we start getting on your ass, then we all black. Somebody sent me this link of some dude. He made a, this one dude, I think he's in the UK. I don't know. I think he might be, he might be either Nigerian or from Jamaica. I don't know who he is, but he was criticizing me. Talking about, you know, us being foundational black Americans and talking about how black Americans, he's talking, this dude, now I want y'all to listen to this. He's talking about how we, Foundation of Black Americans, we have an identity crisis. So I think this guy is Nigerian, by the way. He's talking about how Foundation of Black Americans, we have an identity crisis. Now I want y'all to listen to this. Somebody sent me this. And listen to the projection and the lies that this type of guy, dudes like this use. Listen to the projection and the lies, hold on. And while I'm doing this, hit the Hidden History Museum link and contribute to the museum. In recent years, I've been watching the, um, the African-American community, right? And the African-American com community um, seem to be going through an identity crisis. That's just my own personal view. So what I've watched is African-Americans say that they're African-American. Then I've heard them say that they're, they're American. They're not African. I heard them say that they're black. And then came in... They said they're not black, they're Moors. Then they said they're not Moors. Then they said they are Aboriginal. Then they said they're not Aboriginal, that they are Ados. And then they went from Ados, which is American descendants of slaves, to FBA, which is foundational black Americans. So to me, right, watching that from over here, Seems like there's an identity crisis with a lot of black people in America. Um, it's not. Currently, the FBA, Foundational Black Americans, um, is being led by a guy called Tariq Nasheed. Tariq. Okay, let's stop there. I'm not leading Foundational Black Americans. You can't lead a lineage. A Foundational Black American is what you are. You're born a foundational black American. I cannot lead a lineage. When I speak of foundational black Americans, see, that, don't mix me with ADOS. ADOS is a bullshit LGBT organization that means anything. I don't know what that shit is. It's a whole bunch of bullshit. Foundational black American, that's a lineage. All of, that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. You can't lead a lineage, it's a lineage. You are a foundational black American. If you are a descendant of slaves, if you came from this lineage, if you are a non-immigrant, you are a foundational black American. If you are part of the group who founded and built America, you are a foundational black American. That's not an idea, that's not a, a theory. A group of black people built America. That's a fact. There was a group of black people who built America from scratch when there was no America. It wasn't immigrants. It wasn't Europeans who did it. It was foundational black Americans, a very distinct group of people who were part of the aboriginal black people who were here and some of the black people who were brought over later on. Okay, that combination and the activities that we had to endure makes us foundational black Americans. It's that simple. So it ain't led by anybody. It's a lineage. It's that simple. All right, I just wanted to clear that up. See how they try to remix shit for their own narrative? Hold on. Nasheed has done uh, a documentary series, um, which has you know, become very popular, um, called Hidden Colors. And I watched Hidden Colors. I like the documentary. I think there were some things that were missed in that documentary. Um, but what I have noticed is these quote-unquote foundational black Americans have a disdain to some degree for people who are black, quote-unquote, but not from America. So okay, see that? 
See, two lies for the price of one. Ladies and gentlemen, when they say that, that's these niggas projecting. That's them projecting. We don't have no damn disdain for none of these people. We're just not going to let you come over here and undermine us. Black Americans, foundational black Americans, let's be clear. We don't give a damn about what y'all doing over there. That has zero concern to us. We do have a problem with y'all being brought here to undermine us, to actively work to harm us. We have disdain for that because that makes you a coon. We have disdain for the Candace Owenses and all these people who come here to undermine us. So miss me with that, we just have disdain for you because you are a foreigner. No, that's you projecting, brother. Uh, let me play the rest of this line, Negro. Okay? So already, this is what we have disdain for. People from other cultures who come from these lying-ass cultures, a culture of lying and scamming. Brother, you're a liar. We have disdain for liars. Because that's a damn lie you just told with a straight face. That's what we have disdain for. So they don't like Car Caribbeans and they don't like Africans from the continent. Well, Where are you from? Where am I from? I'm from New York. Okay, so he's playing this as an example of why we quote unquote don't like Africans and Caribbeans. This is a coon who was in our chat room. Y'all remember we were doing a live. This was a foreign coon who was trolling all day. He was in the chat room trolling and calling us all types of fucked up names and he was trolling foundational black Americans and he got on and I lit his ass up. Okay, let's be clear. Why, why, why would y'all like- Where is your family from? From Jamaica. Okay, shut the fuck up and respect foundational black Americans. You I'm not from, respecting none of that coon shit. What are you talking about? The, the coon is you why? and the coward fucking family that had to bounce because you failed in Jamaica, nigga. That's because we failed coward. in Jamaica? You failed in fucking Jamaica. And then what happened, in, what happened to everybody that's in America? Nigga, we're still here fighting. That's what we're doing. We didn't run like so, bitches. So you, you ran like a bitch. So FBA, wait, FBA. The, I'm uh, saying the, you Wait, wait no, bitch. I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Let me ask you. You ran like a bitch. I'm telling you. No, no, don't ask me nothing. No, 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 no because I'm tasking you. Your family, family, FBA, your family yo, ran FBA like bitches. Yo, FBA support Malcolm X? Nigga, your family ran Yo, like FBA bitches. support Malcolm X? You ain't at liberty to say nothing I'm about the foundation of black Malcolm Americans. X. Nigga, FBA Malcolm X got Malcolm X. enough. The Malcolm X was half foundational black American. You ain't got nothing to do with Malcolm X. You say X. he was half? Yes, he was. But his his whole, dad was the foundation of black American. The whole thing that he was talking about came from the Jamaican nigga. What are you talking about? Nigga, first of all, Marcus Garvey was a Jamaican. He said y'all weren't shit. Marcus Garvey didn't get shit popping in Jamaica. He got it popping here. Y'all try to tell the Marcus Garvey lie. Marcus Garvey left Jamaica in disgust because of coons like your bitch ass. She's a Nigerian immigrant. And we've told you over and over again about those Nigerian bedwinches and coons who come over here who can't wait to get up under white mommy and zaddy and throw shit in black. We can easily put this argument to bed as to who you are. You will take DNA tests, you will show who you are, and I'm sure it will come back that you are actually from Africa. Do it, okay, okay, okay. This is, this is tether babble talk, okay? Let's stop this. Well, let's look at your DNA. Look, everybody came from Africa. You, if you do a DNA test on damn near everybody on the planet, some of their DNA is gonna go back to goddamn Africa. We ain't talking about DNA and genetics. Genetically, yes, yes, we have African DNA because everybody on the fucking planet comes from Africa. I'm out here in the middle of damn nowhere. I'm by the, the Indian Ocean. Over right next to me in North Sentinel Island is an island full of fucking black people. Black as hell. Now, if we were to test them, the shit would go back to Africa. But culturally, these people ain't been to Africa in 65,000 years. There's people here in the Maldives blacker than me. If you test their DNA, it's gonna go back to Africa. These people are jet black over here where I am, by the way, guys. But culturally, they're their own, they got a whole different culture. 
when Negroes try to play that, well, the DNA, everybody, you, we do your DNA, it's going to go back to Africa. See, that's the way these tethers can leech off us. See, the name of the game is for them to leech off of our achievements and accomplishments as foundational black Americans, because foundational black Americans will get some shit popping. We'll get something popping. So they need to be able to grasp on to that by showing, okay, at least we got a genetic connection. So whatever you get, I'm supposed to get. If you get some, I'm supposed to get it too. But if they get some, hey, get your black ass off of it. That's why, let's go back to the Olympics. When those two Jamaican women won the, the Olympics, all of a sudden it became Jamaicans are the, the best and y'all Americans ain't shit. Whoa. Yeah, black Americans ain't shit. Jamaicans are the best. Oh, we so, we so much different from y'all black Americans. We eat different. Everything. Is, so all of a sudden y'all different. When the Jamaican women won the relay, every, in, the, in the American, when the Jamaican women run, won the relay, they started going in on the black woman who didn't even compete. They made a point to differentiate themselves from black Americans. Okay? Because culturally, we have different cultures and we have different ethnic groups. Even in Africa, see, don't, don't let them run that. We all, if you run the DNA, niggas on Africa, niggas in the continent of Africa share the same DNA on the same continent, but they be warring and beefing against each other because of tribal differences. They are the masters of that. In Africa right now, you have people living not on the same continent, but in, in the same country, looking the same way. But talking about, nigga, I'm Igbo. Fuck all that Yoruba shit you talking. Y'all got tribal beefs within your country. Forget about the continent. Y'all have tribal beefs, DNA to be damned. In your country, you got tribal beefs that that DNA shit don't make, that don't mean nothing to y'all. Y'all know different ethnic groups have different um, ideologies and y'all use that shit to battle and war against each other all the time. The problem is we didn't stop letting you do it to us. That's the problem. We have stopped letting y'all pull that shit on us as foundational black Americans for years. We sat up and let them come around us, undermining us, doing all types of little sneaky shit. So now we're checking everybody's paperwork now. We're checking everybody's passport. When you come around us trying to speak for us, nigga, let me see your documents, my dude. Who are you? Because you sound funny, nigga. The shit you talking sounds weird. We trying to get some building. You trying to hate on it. Who are you, my nigga? Miss me with that, we got the same DNA because look, we had the same DNA when some of them Ebos was selling brothers too, right? When them Ebos was getting with the Portuguese traders, uh, when they were getting with them damn Spanish traders and them Portuguese slave traders, yeah, we shared the same DNA too while they were waving bye-bye when niggas was floating on them boats to the Western Hemisphere. We shared the same DNA too. Don't come hollering at me about no goddamn DNA now when we done woke up and said, hey, man, enough is enough. Y'all niggas are, y'all, we ain't on the same page. Y'all niggas are all cold with us. But hey, look, I took a DNA test, brother. My brother, look, we're from, we're from, we're from the same region. You and I are the same. And the minute some white folks come around, fuck that nigga. No, we're not playing that game, bro. No, no, we're not playing that game at all. Let me play some more of this dude. We ain't playing those games at all. Hold on. Your DNA, your genetic line will be from uh, Africa. I've watched African-Americans say that they're Hebrews, the original Hebrews. I've watched them say that they're original Muslims. And I'm just wondering when. They do that in Africa, dude. They do that in Africa, dude. What the? F we got an identity crisis, and they do the same thing in Africa. We're going to get to a time um, for quote-unquote African-Americans to understand who they are. Um, the history of black people in America is a... Um, it's not a happy uh, history. So, as far as we know, they were taken from the continent. It's not a happy history? How happy was the history in Africa now, nigga? How's... 
Nigga, Africa is in poverty right now. It's in squalor. How happy is the African history right now? Nigga, things are worse in Africa. What are you talking about? It's not a happy history. Like shit is popping in Africa. Nigga, your accent is British. <laughs> this nigga is up here talking with a British accent because he had to get the fuck out of Africa. This nigga got a British accent talking about things weren't happy in Africa. Nigga. I mean, things weren't happy in America for black people. Things weren't happy in America. Nigga, you up here in Britain, because you fled. You ain't in Africa, bruh, bruh. Talking about things weren't happy in America, and this nigga up here with a British accent. Because you ain't in Africa. That means you got the hell on early. You think these folks, boy, they got a lot of nerve, man. Hold on, hold on. Of Africa, they were brought over on slave ships. Not all and of us. They were made into the current people that we have there today, right? And so during that time, Africa was demonized in their eyes. They oh. didn't want to be seen as African because what, what? Okay. Africans lived in mud huts and, you know, were around campfires, probably burning, co cooking people in cauldrons and all this kind of stuff. That was the the narrative, but we... Do you see what this Negro... Okay, this is how, this is how coons work. This Negro just said, well, the image of Africa was demonized in their eyes, in us, in foundational black Americans. He said the image of Africa was demonized in the eyes of foundational black Americans. We'd been the ones talking about Pan-Africanism. Martin Delaney, it was us the first people talking about Pan-Africanism. We was talking about that. He said that Africa was demonized in the eyes of foundational black Americans, talking about mud huts and cooking people in pots. It was white people promoting those stereotypes. Notice he didn't criticize the white people promoting that. White people came up with the mud huts and cooking in the pots. It was white people who came up with that. We weren't tripping on y'all like that. We weren't tripping on y'all like that because we knew many of us, our lineage came from the indigenous black people in America. Many of us, our indigenous come, our, our lineage comes from the indigenous people in America. A lot of us come from black indigenous people. 6% of the people brought over during the slave trade made it to North America a very small percentage. A lot of black people were already here. This is a fact that we're gonna to have to drive home. Family, this is why we gotta get this museum. Family, I'm gonna have a whole section where I break this down. This has to be broken down meticulously and laid out because this is a story that's never told how we were already here. We gotta really, really drive that shit home. We gotta really drive that home to stop the confusion. Hold on. We live in the information age, right? So the information as to who you are can actually be found. However, it seems like a lot of African-Americans, not all, um, when I look at this identity crisis that they're going through, have chosen to become um, anything but what they are genetically. If we were to go no, back your no, to no, no, 1921. No, your genetics, no, no, no. What you are culturally. See, he keeps trying to play the genetic game. Everybody's African genetically. Everybody came from Africa. Literally everybody on the planet came from Africa. We can't judge by that because after a while, you become and you form different cultures based on the environment that you are taken to or the environments that you migrate to. The cultures change, the physiology changes, your diet changes, everything about you changes based on the environment that you would eventually go to, migrate to, or whatever. We have changed into a different ethnic group. So sitting up here talking about your genetics, your DNA, hell, most white people got African DNA. Again, the white boy that I played earlier, his mama, his grandmama's black. But this motherfucker's a white supremacist, got Trump flags and Blue Lives Matter flags. Because they understand culture. I don't give a shit about no damn genetics. The genetics is not what it is. It's the culture. Your culture shows your identity. Hold on. And we go back to Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
and we go back to what they call Black Wall Street. Um, black people in America um, were millionaires. They were doing very well, you know, after, you know, after slavery and, you know, they built a whole town in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was subsequently burnt to the ground and bombed from the sky by the KKK and um, other hate groups, the police, etc., etc. I'm not saying that black people in America do not have a stake in America. They do. They have a stake in America, and I get that. However, the system that America is has shown them time and time and again that it treats you a certain way. And so for African Americans to um, sever, sever that tie to Africa, to the continent in which they originally came from, makes no sense. If what? Your what? For us to sever it? For us to sever it? Family, where in the hell are they creating a, 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 a pan-African movement in Africa right now with us on a large scale? What country is inviting us over? No red tape. I'm talking about no red tape. Don't tell me about no goddamn Ghana because they got all types of red tape with that that um, right to abode. There are no African countries inviting black people over there to build nothing. What is he talking about? There are no African countries right now inviting us over in a large group to build nothing. They don't have no plots of land set aside for us or nothing. What is he talking about? In fact, they trying to get the hell out of there and come over here among us. You see? What is he talking about? Hold on, let me play the rest of this. Come on, we got an identity crisis? Hold on, where we at, where we at guys? Hold on, where we at, hold on, hold on, where we at, okay. You're trying to build your Wakanda, oh, quote unquote. Lord. You're trying to All build your stuff. Wakanda no, we not. in um, America. Okay, this which... is, oh, that's patronizing, dude. We don't give a fuck about no Wakanda, we, we don't. We, we, it ain't no Wakanda, dude. We, that's patronizing. The people on Black Wall Street tried in, 19, in the 1920s. Oh, it's Patrick. been already shown to you that it can be destroyed. For you to only, as a black person in America, to only um, associate yourself with the continent of North and South America would be, for me, a huge mistake. Um, I think African Americans should start building bridges with the continent of Africa. As much as Af- But well, nigga, what, what you want us to do? Y'all ain't, y'all ain't building nothing, where's the bridge? Okay, where's the bridge? In order to build a bridge, one side of the bridge has to be built, and then another side of the bridge has to meet that side. Where is your side of the bridge, bro? The fuck you talking about? We done built the bridge over here, let's, come on. When y'all come over here, all the shit we fought for, you eat off of. All the HBCUs, you eat off of. All the set-aside programs that we fought for, you eat off of. It was black folks in the streets fighting for immigration for African immigrants and Caribbean immigrants. It was black people fighting. It was black politicians fighting. Even now, the Congressional Black Caucus, they're the main ones fighting for y'all to come y'all asses over here and eat off us. We got the tax dollars that y'all eating off of. Y'all come in our communities and we protect you and you eat off us. We become the customers for your businesses. We need to build a bridge? Really, nigga? We can't build a bigger bridge. The bridge has a one-way street on it, though. That's the problem, nigga. Build the other side of the bridge. There is a bridge that you can come over here and eat off us. It's a one-way street, though. You need to build the other side of the bridge, bro. We can't get nothing over there. All that land, man, y'all can... I went to Zimbabwe damn near begging for land over there and dual citizenship. They were like, uh... Y'all could have been done that. You just don't want to. Don't come over here telling us what the fuck we need to do. If that's how it is, we're like, look, if y'all ain't really trying to build nothing, hey, we can just empower our group. Y'all eating off us anyway, and not only are you eating off us, niggas are coming over here undermining us. Not only are you eating off of us, y'all sending y'all tethered coons over here to undermine our ass. So when we start talking about building another Black Wall Street, 
it ain't the white folks. When we say we want to build a museum, family, do y'all know how many immigrant coons have been shitting on the idea of us building a museum? All of these African and Caribbean immigrants are the main ones talking down on it. But we got to build a bridge for y'all? We didn't build the damn bridge, dude. Give me a break, man. Hold on. Africa, in certain parts of Africa has its problems. You don't have the problem of systematic racism in Africa because it's a black continent. Many places what? in what? Um, Africa are very welcoming of... Um... Hold on. Did y'all hear what this dude said? Let me play that one more time. Hold on. A black person in America to only um, associate yourself with the continent of North and South America would be for me a huge mistake. Um, I think African-Americans should start building bridges with the continent of Africa. As much as Africa, certain parts of Africa has its problems, you don't have the problem. What do you mean? He's minimizing what's going on in Africa. See, this is the thing. He's trying to minimize the shit going on in Africa. Well, some has its problems, dude. It's deplorable poverty all over Africa, dude. It's not really popping. It's deplorable poverty where the whites and the Asians come over there and start running shit. You got people living in shanty towns over there and white people living high off the hog and people shitting in the streets. It's way beyond just problems. It's completely devastated. But catch this again, what he said. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't mean to put this up here. Hold on. Wait. Of systematic racism in Africa because... It's a black continent. Many places oh, wait, 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 problems. Wait. You don't have the problem of systematic racism in Africa because it's a black continent. Okay, now family, this is the reason why we ain't really trying to hook up with you like that anyway. Because see, you don't understand how white supremacy works. We don't need to be around confused niggas. This dude said because Africa is a black continent, there is no systematic white supremacy in Africa. Nigga, do you understand how white supremacy works? Africa is completely dominated by systematic white supremacy, and this is where y'all mess up. My African brothers and sisters, if you think that your countries and the continent is not dominated by systematic white supremacy <clears throat> because all you see are black faces, I got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. The reason why your leadership is corrupt is because they are puppets of the white supremacist regime. The reason why there's so much poverty is because it's the white supremacists that economically rape your countries. They don't have to be there to economically devastate you. Some of those countries that were colonized by the French, they still control the resources there. They still have to pay off France and give a lot of the money and the resources from the banks to France. Even Britain. They still control your countries economically. Just because you don't see the white supremacists, you think that there is no problem with white supremacy. So when a white person shows up, y'all niggas get to dancing and cheesing and bucking your eyes. Because it's the good white people who came to bring me some food. But the good white person who came to bring you some food that you tap dancing for, that good white person is going to bring in the oil companies that's going to rape the country for oil. That good white person is going to set up the orphanages so they can take pictures with your kids. Look at this baby with all the flies on his, his neck and his river. He can't drink because the water is poisoned because of the factory that we just built. With this dumb nigga sitting up here talking about ain't no white supremacy and we white folks then built a, a factory that's poisoning the river so the kid is out here starving and hungry but we're going to take a picture of the kids and have y'all send us some money to feed this kid that we're going we gonna to get a billion dollars and throw a grain of rice at him but ain't no white supremacy though because you confused bro brother you are confused as to what white supremacy is and how white supremacy works Africa, all of it, is completely dominated by white supremacy. All of it. Let one of those African leaders over there say that they don't want to give a certain form of medicine to the people and watch what happens to them. Watch how quickly some of these African and Caribbean leaders 
get shot. Ain't no white supremacy because there's a bunch of black faces. Ask the president of Haiti how he felt about that. Oh, you can't because he ain't here. Who you think orchestrated his assassination when they ran up in his damn house? Bussing on him. Who you think organized that? Over there in Nigeria, y'all sitting up here talking about, he up here talking about ain't no white supremacy and they got a big ass statue of white Jesus in Nigeria. But ain't no white supremacy. And a big statue of a white Jesus. But ain't no white supremacy? And Nigeria is named by a white woman. A white woman named Nigeria that name. This is why you better understand history. This is why us Foundation of Black Americans, we, we, as far as dealing with white supremacy, we certain got, we have somewhat of an edge on other people. We still haven't defeated white supremacy, but we kind of understand most of the inner workings of it in order to kind of move and manipulate around a little bit. Other folks, some of these folks I hear, they're done. They're just, they, they're done. When they start talking this crazy, they're useless to us. Because you ain't gonna help us fight white supremacy and you talking down, you talking dumb like this, talking about ain't no white supremacy over here. Nigga, you already lost. Notice all these people from these other places are the first ones talking about ain't no white supremacy, like the, the Puerto Rican dude. Y you black Americans talk about white supremacy too much. Well, nigga, Trump and all these people over there disrespecting your folks. No, Trump, that dude, he, he was just playing, dude, and he sit up there with a Trump flag. That's the nigga who's conquered. That's a dude who's conquered. When Trump goes to your country, disrespects it, and you sitting over here with a Trump flag, you are conquered. Psychologically, it's one thing to be conquered physically, but to be conquered here is different. We still got some fight in us, man, here. Hold on, play some more of this dude. Many places in um, Africa are very welcoming of um, African Americans. Places as like visitors, Rwanda, as places visitors. like Ghana, um, places like Nigeria, they quite do as visitors. Ain't we're not being welcomed over there like that because if we were being welcomed so much, they would give us dual citizenship and land, which they have not. African Americans, and I just think that the um, the foundational Black American movement and the ADOS movement and stuff like that is just more division, and um, it speaks to an identity crisis that black people in America have. I think it was Chris Rock. Okay, okay, that's enough of this dude. So we have the identity crisis, but they got a gazillion different fucking tribes over there. They got a bunch of tribes over there who identifies as uh, um, Tutu, Tutsi, Hutu, um, Yoruba, Igbo, Asante, the same people, they got all of these different tribes over here, but we got the identity crisis. You got all of those different tribes over there and white people come, on, come along. It's two white people come to your village and then they're running the whole village. But we got an identity crisis. You go to South Africa, they got the blacks and the coloreds and the whites and all the blacks and the coloreds are living in shanty towns. The coloreds, their shanty towns look a little bit better, but then the white people are living all in luxury. But black people are 90% of the population. But we have an identity crisis because they got all of these tribal differences with each other. But we got a damn identity crisis? Nah. You see? See, these dudes, this dude think he's a black Briton. I told y'all about that. A lot of these dudes from the Nigeria, from Africa, they think that they're black Britons and a lot of black folks from the Caribbean, they think that they're black French and they're black Britons. They think that they're just dark skinned members of the British Empire. You understand? That's why they start talking goofy like this. These are the niggas who are psychologically conquered. So. We, we don't want to be over there with you because we're going to be over there. Let me tell you something about us, brother. Let me tell you something about foundational black Americans, brother. Nigga, you don't want us to come over there. Because number one, we come over there, a lot of the coon shit is going to stop. A lot of them Asians whooping everybody's ass over there, that's going to stop. The white supremacists who's over there, they're going to get some of that work. Over there in South Africa, they're just gunning folks down, and the white people are the, the minority. They're gunning folks down. You let us over there. We'll fix that. All of these random white supremacists gunning y'all down, and you're the majority. We fix that. 
It'll be Molotov cocktail time. It'll be burn baby burn time if we went over there to South Africa with that bullshit. Nigga, you better ask somebody. You let us come over there. First of all, we're going to get all the, the diamonds and all that gold. Oh, we're going to get that shit together. All these niggas standing around and a handful of Asians smacking you up, getting all the gold and diamonds. Oh, no. Oh, we're going to change that tonight. We're going to change that shit tonight. We're going to get them out of there. Somebody said the bag wigs going to stop. Yes, we're going to step the wig game up. Yeah, we're going to. Yeah. You understand? We going to step that up. Shit, you are sitting up on all them. That's one thing that always tripped me out. All the all that gold and all them diamonds and y'all the majority and everybody else coming over getting them. Shit. So, yeah, y'all know I get down because psychologically we think different. And remember, for years, for decades, it was black people that was going over there to Africa, really starting some of these revolutions over there. That's why they didn't want us, the, the, the white colonizers, they didn't want us over there. It was black people going over there into South Africa, rowling the people up to get them to fight against the white supremacist regime. It was us going over there doing that shit. A lot, it's a lot of us who get people riled up. You understand? Look, when we had the civil rights movement over here, they saw that and were like, okay, we need to do what they're doing. That's when they started getting their independence. Notice they started getting their independence in a lot of those countries, late 50s, early 60s. That's not a coincidence. They saw our get down. They saw our get down. Yeah? They saw what we were doing. Let's be very clear. But look, brothers and sisters from the continent who's rocking with us, we rock with you. If you down, we down. If you come over here and you're going to be an ally and an asset to our movement, to us fighting white supremacy and us building, we rock with you. But black Britons, you can stay wherever the fuck you need to be. We damn sure don't need to be around you. And you sit up here talking about ain't no white supremacy over here in Africa because there's a bunch of black faces? No. You're confused about how white supremacy works. We don't need no damn confusion. Anyway, y'all, let me get out of here. I'm about to get in this damn pool. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been talking, chopping up game with the family for a minute here. Everybody, go to hiddenhistorymuseum.com. Let's get, we're at 279 right now. We're almost at 280,000. We got 17 days to go, ladies and gentlemen. All right, here we are right now. We're almost at 280. Let's get to 300K by the end of the evening, ladies and gentlemen. We got 17 days, guys, to get to a million. Can we do it? Can the Black Empowerment family do it? I believe we can do it. I know we can do it. And we need everybody, all hands on deck. We need to make this happen. We're getting close to the, the finish line here. We got 17 days. This is all or nothing. Either we get the million or we can't get it popping. We got to get this done and we're going to get it done. We got 17 days. We can do this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a monumental feat. When we do this, this is going to set the stage and set the tone and kind of set things in motion to show that we Black people on a grassroots level, we can get big projects popping without having to grovel to the dominant society or having to depend on the one tokenized black person who got papered up by the dominant society. We're going to have to learn how to get into the habit of getting projects like this done on our own on a grassroots level. Family, I'm already proud of where we are right now. I'm already, already very proud because we're already almost at 280. Look at this right here. I just want y'all to take a look. We've done this in two weeks. This right here, what you see on the screen, a project never done like this before. There's never been a real grassroots project like this done before. In two weeks, we got over a quarter of a million dollars, and this is just from our working class black 
man, black woman, brothers and sisters, everyday brothers and sisters, no celebrities, no nobody else. This is us doing this. This is grassroots brothers and sisters. We're doing this. We got this going in two weeks. Let's keep that thing going, ladies and gentlemen. Go to hiddenhistoryfilm.com. Let's take this thing home. Let's go to the, uh, let's take it to the glory. This is our destiny to do this, guys. We are foundational black Americans. We are powerful people. We've done things like this in the past, building our communities, and we can do this right here, ladies and gentlemen. All right, y'all be good, man. Y'all be safe. Y'all have a blessed week. Y'all have an empowered week. 